Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts for today. I am John DeLynn. I am joined by one of my two or three main partners in truth and righteousness, Gerardo Simano. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, John. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Excited to be here, as this, always. This is an exciting one. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. We are. It's March 4th, and we are here uh, bringing back onto our program uh, someone who is who is uh, a legend as far as I'm concerned, but also someone who has been doing really important work for Mormon Stories podcast. We uh, we reintroduce to you all Dr. Simon Southerton, geneticist from Australia. Hey, Simon. Good day, John. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, and we are here. Um, in our next in a series that we have just started on Mormon stories with with uh, Dr. Southerton or with Simon called what is it Mormon doctrine science versus Mormon doctrine what's it called yeah, Mormon, Mormon doctrine, Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine. Yes. okay yeah and all this is is once a month we bring Simon on uh he has a lot of experience in science as it relates to Mormon church truth claims and once a month we have Simon addressing um an issue where where science bumps up against Mormon doctrine or truth claims. And while we are talking about that, I just need to show you how we make this possible. So if you go to mormonstories.org slash Simon, it'll take you to this website. And on this website, we announce this program and there's a little donate button there. The reason why I'm mentioning this at the beginning is we feel like it's important to, um, you know, to pay Simon for his work. Simon has been doing basically really important work for for us uh, Mormons, uh, post Mormons, for literally decades. He's been doing this longer than me, and that's saying something. And so we are paying Simon for his efforts. It's probably almost symbolic, but I think for him it's maybe a little bit motivating. But most importantly for us, we feel like it's just um, it's just sustainable, and so. Because some of you have stepped up, we've started paying Simon. And what we would ask you to do is if you value this series on a science versus Mormon doctrine, become a monthly donor. Go to mormonstories.org slash Simon, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. And what you'll get for free um, uh, because of your donation, you'll get emailed a, uh, a link to Simon's newest book called The Sacred Curse. And this is just a book about um, how Native American DNA exposes Mormonism's Lamanite myth. It's basically an updated book um, from uh, from Simon's original book called Losing a Lost Tribe, which was very instrumental to my own faith journey way back in the early 2000s. And so become a monthly donor for Simon, support financially this series on science versus Mormon doctrine. Um, and uh, you'll get a free book along the way as well. And uh, that's that's basically all I wanted to say as an introduction, other than to say, Simon, well, Gerardo, thanks for making this happen. And and Simon, we're so excited to have you on. So uh, how would you like to continue the conversation, Simon? Well, thanks very much, John. It's, a, it's really, I um, got quite excited actually about the, the science versus Mormon Doctrine series because we've had some wonderful feedback. There's quite a, um, quite a lot of interest in the series and I'd really encourage people to continue to give, in, to give feedback and suggestions because it's, it's going to make the, the podcast even better. Um, so, and, and we've taken notice, people will realise as we go through the, today's discussion that we're, we're taking on board many of the comments that are being made and the suggestions about people that we can uh, involve in the, the podcast series. So, um, yeah, like I'm, I I do like enjoying, I, I do enjoy talking about science. So, um, um, yeah, it's, it's off to, a, I think, a pretty positive start. Um, but before we go any further, I just wanted to uh, give a bit more background about how I, and, and I think John as well imagine the, the series uh, panning out. Um, we don't want it to be a sort of a gotcha series where we embarrass um, people who have very still, may have still uh, quite strong beliefs um, related to the Mormon church. 
Um, we just want to point out doctrine and then discuss science that's relevant to it and then look at the way that um, maybe apologists in the church have dealt with that. But we're, we're, we're endeavouring to do that in a respectful way. We don't want to, to embarrass people or, or catch uh, the church out. Um, so we will talk about things that are not necessarily doctrine, but they're interesting sides, um, but we're not going to pin them on the church. They're, they're, every church has um, sort of little, little embarrassing things in their past. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm a huge fan of consensus science. If, if scientists from diverse fields um, have all reached the same opinion, um, then I think we can be uh, fairly confident that it's, it's factually solid and it's the truth. Um, so, so if things are fringe, I will probably say they're fringe, um, but I, I do endeavour to, to stick to the well-established facts and if, if I do stray and somebody, if I do say something wrong or whatever, I'm more than happy to have feedback. Um, the series will not be a huge sort of download of um, lots of little snippets of science that are uh, fact, uh, related to the topic. It, we're just going to focus on little stories that I, um, that I have found pretty uh, important in my life, but also um, pieces of science that are particularly relevant to um, LDS um, doctrinal claims and the, and the doctrines that the church hold. Um, and the other thing is that we, uh, we in, I think in almost every episode, we're going to be joined by a real live scientist. Um, so we do actually have a scientist joining us today, uh, Professor Michael Westerway from the University of Queensland, who's done some amazing work on uh, Aboriginal Australians. Um, which is a very important story, a, a critical aspect of uh, the human colonisation of the world. So, um, so he'll join us as when we're talking about science. Um, and uh, I guess some. I also wanted to respond. I will at times respond to some of the feedback that comes from people. Um, and we did have some comments about uh, why intelligent design wasn't mentioned in our previous podcast when we we're talking about creationism. Uh, and the reason for that is that intelligent design is not consensus science. It's a, uh, the, the scientific community um, pretty much doesn't uh, accept uh, that intelligent design is viewed as a, a, vo a form of creationism. Intelligent design is basically the idea that there are some things that are just too complex in the evolution of life on the earth, that there must have been a God behind it. Um, and that's, uh, and that's not, um, a view held by the scientific community and uh, I think intelligent design is taught in some American schools um, in the science classes but I know in Australia it can't be taught in science classes in most developed western countries it's not taught in science classes I think in Australia it's actually taught in historical controversy so um, interesting so yeah so just before we uh, jump into um, talking about the doctrine um some of the highlights later in the project, that's sorry, today's podcast, will be uh, seeing a YouTube clip by uh, John Perry. Uh, John Perry's got a, a fantastic website. If you want to really understand the basics of evolution and and uh, and, and DNA, which is, I think, a, a very common theme in our, uh, in our podcast series, he's got a, a beautiful website called Stated Clearly, which, which is amazing. I'd highly recommend uh, you visit we'll, that site, John. We'll have Jen. Sorry. We'll have Jen add that to the show notes. It's called "State It Clearly." Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. podcast. Okay, it, it, it's yeah. a it's a YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, John is from Tennessee, Bing University, and uh, he's kindly given us permission to show a little a snippet out of one of his uh, YouTube clips, which is just brilliant. So it's sort of about fossil viruses in our genomes. Um, the things called endogenous retrotransposons. Uh, it's simpler to just call them fossil viruses, <laughs> hop around our, our genome. Um, and because that's what they are, they literally are the reminders, the remains of, of viruses that got into our genomes years ago. Um, but his, his little YouTube clip is absolutely brilliant. So big thanks to John, because I've, I've actually stolen a few, well, didn't steal, he gave him permission to take some of his pictures, so. Um, screen grabs from his um, some of his presentations, and you'll I'll see if I can. I'll try to remember to point them out. 
So yeah, that's I ready think, to start. Yeah, ready to go. All right. So uh, should we go to the first slide? Is that the next thing? Yeah. Sure. All right. So yeah. here we go. Um, so yeah, the last slide was um, we talked about creationism, and obviously uh, Adam and Eve is a fairly central component of that. And and so a little bit of the doctrine we talked about last week is is very relevant today. But we didn't take it too much further in the last. Um, podcast. We talked about dog evolution, which is lovely. We can. We, I'd love to talk about dog evolution for ages. Um, but um, but the the key messages that came out of that podcast that are related to uh, today's podcast is that um, Adam is the first of all men. Eve is the mother of all living. Adam and Eve lived about seven thousand years ago. And the Garden of Eden is located in the Americas, in, in Missouri. And there was no mortal death before Adam's fall. So these are, um, and we'll elaborate a little bit on some of these uh, later in the podcast. So, um, and these are all very well uh, backed up by LDS scripture. So the, the rest of the Christian, Christian community uh, just has the Bible and their interpretations of that was the the LDS church has these additional scriptures doctrine and covenants book of you know the books of Moses and Abraham in the pearl of great price and they um, contain i think there's an additional two to three accounts of the creation and Adam and Eve so Adam and Eve are mentioned many many times in LDS scripture but in the bible after the genesis account Adam and Eve are, i think are only mentioned twice so yeah. So Adam and Eve are very critical uh, figures in LDS doctrine. Yeah, they're mentioned a, a couple times in the Book of Mormon, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, they're mentioned in all three of, of them, and uh, in quite detail. Yeah. yeah. And and you'll and that'll sort of become apparent as we talk uh, a bit more. If we go to the next slide, I might get uh, perhaps um, Gerardo, if you could read out that. Um, yeah. The, uh, the Book of Mormon. So this is, this, yeah, this there. is from the Book of Mormon. It says, uh, Second Nephi, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, 22. And now, behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden. And all the things which were created must have remained in the same state, state in which they were, after they were created. And they must have remained forever and had no end. Yeah. It's basically saying, right, that at, like Adam, uh, when he transgressed, when he ate of the partake of the fruit, then um, that's when death was introduced. That's right. The world. Yeah. Perhaps John could read the uh, Pearl of Great Price references there. Just the yellow part or the whole thing? Just, just, I uh, no, the whole thing probably. They're fairly Okay. Brief. Moses 5.11 and Eve... His wife heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed and never should have known good and evil. So basically Eve saying, if we didn't sin, we would have never had kids. Yeah. Um, and then Moses 648, and he said unto them, Because that Adam fell, we are, and by his fall came death. Yeah. I had forgotten so that, that, that that was there in Moses that um, Adam and Eve couldn't have children before the fall. That that's pretty explicit, right there. Yeah, yeah. And by extension, many early leaders of the church um, believed that all of the there was no death of any any beings before the fall. Absolutely, so animals and and so forth i mean yeah. i just have to say i when i was serving my mission I, I got a sense for this in seminary growing up obviously bruce r mcconkey and joseph fielding smith heavily influenced uh kind of my upbringing but um and, and the curriculum and the ces manuals but when i when i got on my mission i discovered these books called doctrines of salvation written by joseph fielding smith and this is all very clear and explicit both in doctrines of salvation and then in Mormon doctrine, anyone who tries to argue this wasn't core Mormon doctrine for forever just doesn't know the history. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. If we move on to the next slide, we now get a time, a fair, a very clear uh, time uh, scale here for when Adam fell. Um, yeah, this is from the LDS Seminary yeah. Manual, 2017. Yeah. Pretty recent. So this this is a current one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Super recent. Yeah. And this is what it says. Do you want me to read it, Simon? Sure. Yeah. Um, it may be helpful to understand that in Doctrine and Covenants 77 6, the 7,000 years is in reference to the earth's temporal existence, meaning since the fall of Adam, it is not commenting on the age of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about Doctrine and Covenants 77 maybe later on, but it's, um, it's an interesting section because it's a Q&A between Joseph Smith and God. So in, in the verses, it actually has Q and A. a. So uh, Joseph Smith had some questions about a revelation of John, and he asked God what this meant, and uh, God was fairly explicit that the, uh, the you know, the... the uh, that basically mankind had been on the earth for, for 7,000 years. So 7,000 years since Adam walked the earth. Yeah, Doctrine and Covenants really leaves no no room for no. sin or debate as to what the church is. Because Doctrine and Covenants is scripture. It's Jesus yeah. himself talking. It's modern day revelation. Yeah. There's no Catholic yeah. church to corrupt the text. Yeah. 7,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we'll, know, as we'll talk about later on, uh, that doesn't stop the apologists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have some amazing references where apologists are sort of trying to weasel their way out of this one. Yeah. Um, which is challenging because this is a QA. and I mean, Joseph Smith's asking a question here because he doesn't fully understand. Right. Why would, why would God be even more, you know, vague again? Okay. Yeah. So and I would say that, that, like, what the church says officially on its manuals, especially something a, a manual that is very, very recent, and it's what it's the youth are being taught, right? Has more way yeah. than whatever uh, an apologist at BYU would have an opinion about, right? Yeah, Certainly because it's been through cor it's been through right. correlation, right. and it's modern, and it's approved <laughs> officially approved by the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If we go to the next slide, now it gets even more interesting. Now we're getting into the territory where it's this is clearly a unique LDS doctrine, and we'll summarise what are the unique aspects of Adam and the pre-Adamites uh, towards the end of our discussion of the doctrine. But, um, yeah, if you go to the – I might read this one out. Um, go for it. It's a pill of great price, Abraham 3, 22 to 24. Uh, now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw these souls that they were good. And he stood in the midst of them. And he said, these I will make my rulers. For he stood among those that were spirits. And he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. And there stood stood one among them that was like unto God, and he said unto those who were with him, we will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. Um, and there are, yeah, so. And Simon, summarize that for us. So here we've got a, a revelation saying that it wasn't just um, God and Jesus Christ, it was the noble and great ones that were involved uh, so it's a it's a well established belief in the church that there were early patriarchs and prophets, um, such as Adam. Adam is preeminent um, among these patriarchs and prophets, but Noah, Abraham, um, probably even Nephi, and probably Joseph Smith as well, um, were involved in the creative process. So the creation of the world um, before uh, we came to it. Um, so this is a fairly unique one. I don't think there's too many other. I, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't any other churches that that hold this um, belief. Yeah. And this scripture, if we go on to the next slide, um, now this is a doctrine that I don't want to pin on the church because I believe this is where 
um, that previous scripture that we just read out, that I just read out, has inspired um, Joseph, uh, sorry, Brigham Young. Uh, this is back in 1852 to make some uh, some pretty uh, bold statements about Adam and his role in the, the creation. Um, so uh, now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organise the world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, the church now obviously distances themselves uh, from this belief. Well, for those um, who don't know, this is the Adam-God theory. That, yeah, um, uh, yeah we, we are basically, that's the, the uh, uh, this was a, um, a general conference sermon, I believe, um, that ended up going into the, the uh, I think it's the Millennial Star, was that the church magazine at the time? Mm. Um, so it... Um, yeah, Millennial Star. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you can see how the previous revelation about there being noble and great ones are involved in the creation of the world, you can see how that sort of inspired um, Brigham Young to to um, to elaborate a little bit further on that, sort of claiming that God, is, uh, you know, Adam is the God that we are, only God that we need to be concerned about here on the earth. Um, but this has been, the, the Adam God theory has been thoroughly denounced by the church. Um, and if you, you want to see a proper denouncing of this theory, then I'd highly recommend you read uh, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce O. McConkie because he absolutely rips into anybody that... Uh, regurgitates this theory cultists and other enemies of the truth restored truth for their peculiar purposes have uh have, have, have talked about the adam god theory but um yeah yeah so i'm, I'm not going to hold this uh, the church to this it's um you know it's these are but it's interesting to see how important adam and eve or adam is in mormon doctrine i think on the temple we learned that well Part of what Brigham Young was teaching is part of the temple ceremony that Adam did help create the earth, that he was Michael, and then Michael was put in, in the earth and, you know, created by Jehovah and yeah. um, Heavenly Father. And um, so it, it just shows how, how, how important this doctrine of or teaching and belief mm -hmm. of Adam is to, to the church. And anyone who's been through the Mormon temple ceremony knows that Adam is central right. to Mormon theology, yeah. creation theology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we flick to the, the there's other revelations to, to add even more um, evidence to this uh, belief in the centrality of, of um, Adam that he was a real person. We've got um, him appearing in visions to other prophets. So in Joseph, in, to Joseph Smith in 1836, he saw Father Adam and Joseph F. Smith in 1918 um, saw Father Adam, the Ancient of Days and Father of All. Mm. Um, so so these are visions that, um, like, you know, prophets have had. So, I mean, it's not surprising really the... the um, those doctrines that we talked about in Abraham about these gods being involved in the creation of the, the world, it's not not surprising that it would have inspired uh, subsequent prophets to to you know have dreams and revelations of this nature. And there's so the, the, do you want to read the Joseph F. Smith quote? Or yeah, do you want to do that? Among the great and mighty ones who were assembled in this vast congregation of the righteous were Father Adam, the Ancient of Days and father of all, and our glorious mother Eve with many of her faithful daughters who had lived through the ages and worshiped the true and living God. And Simon, sometimes yeah. I'm a little bit ham-fisted, but you know, what I under, what I interpret is the reason you're showing this slide is because a more modern, you know, now that science has, has beaten the church up thoroughly on these claims about the creation of the earth and the earth and the age of the earth, mm -hmm. progressive, you know, neo-apologists and progressive Mormons want to say that, well, Adam and Eve, 
the garden story, that's all metaphorical. That's all symbolic. We really don't believe that all humans came from one set of parents because the science just beats that uh, opinion to shreds. Yeah. But but yeah. if you've got Joseph Smith or Joseph F. Smith seeing visions claiming Adam and Eve were seen yeah. in the visions, then that taints the visions and it makes it so either we believe in a literal Adam and Eve or or we're starting to wonder whether these visions are just yeah. fabrications and not real. It's got, it's kind of got to be one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're canonized. There's ones that he has. That's right. These are both in the yeah. Doctrine and Covenants, yeah. and these are recent editions. Yeah. 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 yeah they're canonized. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually have a, an earlier version of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, and these two sections are not in it. Mm. Oh wow! So I was looking. I was looking for the references. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, so uh, you know they're canonized. They're they're put in deliberately because um, they you know they're scripture. Yeah, yeah. So it is very difficult, and the church is not going to pay any attention to apologists. So the apologists can make all these nuanced claims, but uh, at the end of the day, it's they have absolutely zero in zero authority to make any interpretation of scripture. The only people entitled to interpret scripture is the prophets. Yeah. So, On the next slide, you have actually a, a, an interpretation directly by the church of what. Yeah. Yeah. This is our last um, slide as we, or yeah. almost the last slide, we'll summarize the, the doctrine of it. Yeah. So this is Gerardo. Perhaps if you read, read that out, the, um, the highlighted section there. Yeah. Uh, so this is from the church website. Uh, it says we are we we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, our first parents, who were created in God's image. There were no spirit children of Heavenly Father on the earth before Adam and Eve were created. And that's in response to the question, uh, what what, is the what does the church believe about evolution? Yeah. Hmm. So again, the church believes that. Adam and Eve were the first humans, period, right? Yeah. Is that what it's saying, yeah. Simon? Yeah, yeah. All right. They're um, throwing down, they're throwing down the gauntlet. <laughs> well, they're, they're, I mean, if you if you add the doctrine together, you've got Adam and Eve, they lived seven thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. They are the, we are all the descendants of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They're our first parents. Okay, so there's no how do we connect beyond them um, is really gets uh, very challenging. Oh, and there's no death before them. We talk about the science. Yeah. And we're going to talk about science that I think is particularly challenging to this um, particular belief or very difficult, difficult to re very difficult to reconcile um, with that claim. But I thought as we, to finish off our discussion of the doctrine, I thought we just, um, talk about highlight the what I believe are the uniquely LDS aspects of the doctrine related to Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and the fall. Um, so I sorry once somehow there okay. we go. You good? Okay. Uh, now now I'm good. Yeah. So I'll read those out. So Adam and Eve, Adam and other gods helped create the earth. Um, that's clearly I think uh, an LDS one. There was no mortal death before Adam's fall. Um, and of course, the uh, the Garden of Eden is in the United States, um, and uh, yeah, I it was quite interesting. I found as I was reading uh, bits of Genesis and the books of Abraham, Moses, and uh, Doctrine and Covenants uh, in preparation for the podcast, it just felt like um, Mormonism was just so much more vivid. And colourful, you know, it's like it, it, it was sort of elaborating on the on the Bible. So in, in comparison to the Bible, it, it just sort of seemed like it was almost in technicolor, because you, you can see how um, a, a 19th century mind would have learned all of the doctrine related to Adam and Eve f that they could from the Bible, and then they've um, expanded it, if you like, uh, in their own mind. And so we've ended up with things that are really quite, quite uh, unique. Um, 
Yeah. So any other comments you folks want to make before we, hop we have a, Simon, we have a comment, a well-timed comment from one of our viewers. Brian J says, I'm not hearing much science yet. And he's got a smiley face. <laughs> okay. And that that's a that's a good segue into our next slide. What do you think? That's an excellent yeah. <laughs> so um so basically what we're planning, the plan is that we talk 20 or so minutes about the doctrine and then we just jump into science. Like like the last episode, there wasn't enough science. It was very interesting science, dog evolution. But now we're gonna jump into science. And just so um, people so understand, we're we're yeah. trying to lay the foundation. What's Mormon doctrine, so that then we can uh, talk about the science. Talk about science that's relevant to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so today I'm I'm just going to pick out a couple of pieces of science. One or two of them had significant impact on me when I first learned about it. And I thought, wow, gee, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, and then I buried it away. And sometimes that would have been, uh, you know. A, five or 10 years before I had my little faith crisis back in 1998. So, And for those yes. who haven't heard your story, Simon, you were a, a Mormon bishop. Yes. Wow, yeah. you were a geneticist, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of little bits of science that connect us with our very ancient ancestors and with our most recent living ancestor, chimpanzees. So we'll, we'll talk about those. And then I want to talk about the, the human family um, because there's just so, uh, so much fascinating uh, human uh, genetics and genomics that's been done in the last 10 years um, that has completely revolutionized our understanding of, of um, human history. It's just added so much uh, new information. Um, there were scientists, yeah. for example, uh, 20 years ago, arguing, oh, we can't have any, Neand we can't have intermarried or interbred with Neanderthals. And that's complete rubbish because because some scientists were seeing it in some of the fossils. They speculated that there was some interbreeding. But um, as we probably, many of us know, we do actually have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in our genomes, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but before I do, I wanted to just uh, run through some of the technology that I think um, is, is sort of to give a little bit of um, support and background to some of the things that we talk about down the track. Um, I want to talk about carbon dating first of all, and then I'll just sort of run through um, the basics of DNA and genomics. Um, the reason I want to talk about carbon dating is it is just such an amazing technology uh, and it's been used, um, they refer to it basically as the workhorse of um modern archaeology and anthropology. Um, so I'll just run through how it works. Um, so cosmic radiation from the sun, the, most of our, a lot of our atmosphere, 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And cosmic radiation from the sun um, hits our atmosphere and every now and then it hits a nitrogen atom and it converts it into a carbon-14, a radioactive form of of carbon so, and throughout history there's sort of been a fairly stable it does have ups and downs but there's fairly stable amounts of carbon 14 in the atmosphere and living beings if they're eating plants and animals or trees that are taking carbon from the atmosphere um, their carb the amount of carbon 14 in their body or in the in the tree is the same as the atmosphere once they die, though, they're not taking any new carbon-14 in and it then decays away. So the radioactive carbon-14 atoms will uh, break down and they'll convert to carbon. And it's about every 5,700 years, the amount of uh, radioactive carbon halves. So it has what they call a half-life of 5,700 years. Um, and... By measuring the amount of carbon-14 relative to carbon in a, um, say, for example, a fossil or a, uh, a skeleton or in a, a, tr a tree or a, a carbon-containing material, you can get a very good estimate of when um, that, that organism was alive. And so basically... So basically what they're doing is... So they have... From what I was reading, they have it pinned down to a very... 
a pretty good number of, uh, you know, you, you said 5,700 years, right? right? Yeah. Um, and then after that period, the carbon 14 halves. So like there, so there's going to be half the yeah. amount of carbon yeah. 14 um, yeah. after that amount of years. So, hmm. And then after another 5,700 years, is going to half again, right? That's right. It'll be a quarter. Right. And then right. another 5,000, it'll be one-eighth and one-sixteenth. And right. One third so every 5,700 years is just yeah. going to keep having. So then when yeah. they take a skeleton or, or a fossil today, they mm. can see how, how, how much carbon he has, how much carbon-14 he has, and then yeah. they, can, they can know how old, how old is it. Yeah, yeah, they can make a fairly good estimate. And I think it's generally, it's getting more accurate with with time, but it's it's in the vicinity of probably five to ten percent error yeah. on it. But it's pretty, it's very reliable. So when carbon dating was first developed, the technology for detecting radioactive carbon, carbon fourteen, um, was nowhere near as good as it is today. So you could only it was only reliable for about twenty or thirty thousand years. Um, but the technology today is so sophisticated. I mean, this is the, why we're running into the trouble with um, drug takers and the Olympics, because the technology for detecting absolutely minute amounts of particular molecules has has increased so rapidly. We're getting to the point where you can you can almost just walk past somebody that's got a drug in them, and you you'll pick up enough to to be detected. So it's I'm exaggerating, obviously, but um, that's so the techno so the ability to detect carbon 14 in a sample has, has risen dramatically and so it's now they just published last year i think it was a new calibration of um, carbon 14 um, a, a sort of a reference that improves the accuracy and it's now you can date carbon date back to about 60,000 years um, and one of the things that's been really important for cross-validating and, and determining the accuracy of carbon-14, or improving the accuracy of carbon-14, is tree rings. So living trees go back about three, I think about four to 5,000 years, but then in some, uh, in bogs, they've been able to dig up trees that take the, this, uh, the tree ring record back to almost thirteen to 14,000 years. And tree rings are beautiful because if you know, they tell you the exact year and you can cut out the carbon from that year and date very accurately. Um, you can then cross-validate the two technologies, which are quite completely different. And so that gives a, a, yeah. a tremendous amount of a, a confidence that carbon dating is very accurate. Um, for those who don't, um, may not be familiar with tree rings. So basically a tree in winter will lay down thicker, smaller cells and they're quite dark. And in the summer when they're growing or when they've got a lot of water, they'll put in a, a, a much thinner walled rings. Um, so you can, so each one of those pairings of dark and light will be an, a, a complete year. Um, yeah. So like any technology, if it's in the hands of a fool, um, they will make mistakes. For example, if you uh, pull out a bit of charcoal from a fire and you carbon date it, but a, a tree ring, uh, sorry, a tree root had grown through it, um, say uh, 150 years ago, or you know, much more recently, then the carbon from the tree root will completely ruin your your dating. Um, if you're dating, uh, say, carbon from a fire and they've used coal in the fire. Uh, car coal is what they actually refer to as carbon dead, uh, so it it won't have radioactive carbon because it's millions and millions of years old. Um, but uh, so so there are obviously uh, you know stumbling blocks and problems for people who aren't particularly careful. But if you're very careful, you can avoid these sorts of problems. Another one is artificial aging. Um, for example, mollusks and marine animals they often obtain their, the carbon that they obtain into their, into their shells, for example, mollusks or fish, sometimes the carbon that they absorb um, is actually quite old. 
in itself. So it's not it's not the same. It hasn't got the same amount of radioactive carbon as the atmosphere. So that can lead to things um, looking much uh, older than they are. So scientists now have sort of offsets and corrections for any er errors in that can come about from that. Yeah. Um, and you have a slide here with other dating methods, right? Yeah. Before I go on, I just wanted to say one, uh, I, in preparation for this, I looked in because there are many uh, um, apologists who take all sorts of liberties and to, to shred carbon dating. It's very important to, mm. to make carbon dating look unreliable. Uh, and one example is a bunch of um, creationists who, um, because in, in rare situations, coal can have tiny traces of carbon-14, and that's because carbon-14 can also uh, arise from natural radiation that's in, present in the coal. For example, some coal will have uh, uranium, levels of uranium that are a little higher, and that uranium, even though the coal is buried and it's not um, taking in um, carbon-14 from the atmosphere, the uranium can radiation from the uranium can cause formation of very tiny traces of carbon 14. Most coal is carbon dead and it's actually used as a, a, a negative control. Um, but you know, apologists knew that there are, they they sent this coal in to a lab and they got they found that um, there were tiny traces of carbon 14, so they used that. And there's books being written on and all sorts of things claiming that this completely shreds carbon dating, but it's, um, it's uh, clearly not. It's just a uh, just an occasional challenge that a, a competent scientist would be um, well aware of, and uh, it's it doesn't really undermine the mm. effectiveness effectiveness of the technology. So if we hop to the next slide. There are um, so any other questions about carbon dating? No, I love it though. This is yeah. I, I I learned this, you know, in college, but you just forget it if you don't you know think about <laughs> it's it. Just so such it's a, it's really amazing there. stuff and the, the, it's just so advanced these days. Like they just published a new calibration. I, I forgot to mention that in that calibration they had uh they carbon dated stalagmites in China. So a stalagmite is that's basically that calcium carbonate columns that, and uh that form in caves and each in some caves each year they get a new layer of carbon calcium carbonate deposited on the stalagmite and then it gradually grows and because of the changing weather patterns you can see a change in the color through that each year so you get rings that are just like tree rings in the stalagmite and they dated this this um stalagmite in china covered a period of about 15,000 to uh, 55,000 years ago. So absolutely invaluable resource for improving the calibration of um, carbon dating. Mm. So it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it, so you can sort of get a sense that it's not a, it's not a, an old technology that's sitting on the, on the shelf and they just wheel it out. Right. Cause that, I, yeah. I feel like that's how, how apologists try to uh, describe it. Right. Like something that's, yeah. Yeah, something that there are there are journals that are just filled with scientists that are working to improve the calibration. Yeah, um, they they dug a cowrie pine from New Zealand that's forty thousand years old, dug out of a bog. Um, now, uh, Simon, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, we have yeah. Michael on the on on the back. We can now that we're talking, we laid the background about carbon dating. We can bring him on to talk about uh, the Manga Man and and how how they dated it. What how how do you feel about that? Oh, I think we might we might bring him in when we yeah when we're talking about Manga Man. Okay, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, because there's a little bit more stuff to get through there. Before. Okay, sounds good. Excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to make just a brief comment that there are many other dating methods. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, luminescence dating. Um which is a fascinating one that uh, Michael might mention a little bit about later on. Um, but uh, another fascinating one is that the, the um, volcanoes turn out to be very, very important for um, dating 
um, ancient remains because the the layer of, of tephra or pumice that comes out with each volcanic eruption that can be ground out ground up and they can get a very clear chemical signature from that layer um, plus they can use dating techniques such as um, potassium to argon or argon 40 to argon 39 to very accurately date when the eruption was um, and that technology we'll, we'll men mention it later on a bit um, as we talk more about the um, uh, dating of the earliest human fossils. Mm. So if we shift on to, I'll just say a little bit about DNA, quickly run through um, just to, to refresh uh, people's memory. Many of us would have heard this at some stage in our lives. Clearly, uh, DNA is the, the molecule that drives um, life. And the way that it does this is it contains coded information that guides the direction of proteins. And so the mechanisms in our body are for producing proteins from DNA, um, that is through a molecule called RNA. And RNA contains the coded, inf carries the coded information from DNA, and then it's, it's, um, it locks into a molecule called a ribosome, and it's a little bit like a zipper. It sort of zips through that ribosome, and the ribosome will be adding a new amino acid to the molecule, and that amino acid chain then forms the protein. Um, and the way that DNA codes for information going into that protein is that every three bases of DNA in a gene codes for a particular amino acid, and that's called a codon. And when the RNA strand zips through the ribosome, each codon will uh, determine what amino acid attaches. Um, and that's a, a pretty important, a, cr a critical part of, um, of how uh, DNA gu guides the, uh, um, the direction of life by carrying that information through RNA into proteins. <clears throat> And I must thank John Perry for some of these illustrations, which I've borrowed from his Stated Clearly website. So if we turn to the human genome on the next slide. <clears throat> so we mentioned earlier on what uh, DNA is, but DN uh, the entire human genome carries about 3 billion bases of DNA. And a useful way to think of it is just a massive book. And with it, so that book is our genome. And within that genome, that book, there are 20 through, 23 chapters or chromosome pairs. Um, within each chapter, there are a whole lot of sentences that have meaning. Um, they're the genes. They guide um, the production of uh, um, amino acids, uh, sorry, proteins via the uh, assembling of amino acids together. We hop to the next slide. Um, I just this is just an aside out of interest. Um, some of you may know I worked in forestry for years, and we uh, go back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the two tree species that I worked on were conifers and eucalyptus. And you can see in this illustration that the human genome, which is about three billion base pairs, is absolutely dwarfed by the conifer genome. So all the pine trees you see around you, they, their, the size of their genome is about 10 times the size of the human genome. Meanwhile, eucalyptus is about a, a quarter of the size of the human genome. And there are, do, there are plants that have genomes that are much smaller, even like uh, 100 or even 50 million base pairs. Um, so um, the point I wanted to make on this slide is that the, the conifers don't have any more genes necessarily. They, they have what's referred to often as junk DNA, but they just have lots and lots of repetitive DNA. And we're going to talk a little bit about repetitive DNA or, or transposon, transposons a little bit later on. Um, but it's, it's, there are pieces of DNA, lots of DNA in our genomes that just reproduces itself and, and doesn't actually serve any function in the body. 
So if we hop to the next slide, we not only have the human genome, we now have the complete genome of Neanderthal, which is a, a very close relative of humans, and we have the genome of Denisovans. So they're also about 3 billion base pairs in size. Um, hey, so, really Simon, important? let me ask you, yeah. th this is going to seem like just a really obvious question. Hmm. What is a what is a Neanderthal and what is a Denisovan for those who just don't know? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them okay. later on. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. um, not too long actually. I think it's fairly fairly soon. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but yeah, they're they're fairly close relatives. So I think Neanderthal and Denisovan split from each other about eight hundred thousand years ago. Um, but what's fascinating is the Denisovan DNA. We don't even know what a Denisovan really looks like because the uh, the entire genome was, which was published in 2012, was from a finger bone, and that's all we have from Denisovans. The scientists could tell it was it was slightly different to a human finger bone, um, and they got a whole a new archaic human relative from that genome. The Neanderthal genome was published in 2010. Um, so the point I want to make on this slide is that, that the, the fascinating information that can come out of those three genomes is the differences. So even within the human genome, there are millions, to, uh, three or four million variants or SNPs or markers. These are points in the genome where there is a difference that's commonly found in the population. Um, and so the, mil, there are millions of markers that are unique to humans unique to Neanderthals and unique to Denisovans. Um, and that information is enormously valuable and, and can tell us an awful lot about our ancestry. And today, if you're getting your DNA tested by a DNA ancestry company, they are using that information. They're using all of those millions of variants to tell you where your ancestors came from. Um, yeah. But... Scientists are using that information as well. And they're asking much, much deeper questions about our deeper ancestry. And that's, I think, what we're... Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. So that's what I wanted to say in terms of background um, science. And then we'll just sort of jump into um, what I think are some quite interesting aspects of... of um, biology that tell us our, who our distant relatives are and our more common, more recent relatives. So we hop to the next slide. I can't remember when I first came across this, um, but mitochondria, which are these small organelles in our, each one of our cells, and we can often have many, many copies of a mitochondrial genome in a cell. If you're they, they, they generate, mitochondria generate the power in our cells. Um, and so muscle cells, for example, have lots and lots of mitochondria. Um, and I was fascinated to learn, yes, these things look, these mitochondria look like bacteria. Um, and in fact, it turns out there's an awful lot of evidence that our mitochondria were in fact bacteria that were absorbed into the very earliest what they refer to as eukaryote cells on the earth. And this is about 2.7 billion years ago when the first eukaryote um, came into existence. Um, and so this was a probably a fairly random occurrence. Um, there are lots and lots of failures in evolution, but uh, this one really worked and kicked off the evolution of um, plants, animals and fungi. On the earth, plants and animals and fungi all have uh, mitochondria. Um, but there are even further clues in mitochondrial DNA to to suggest um, very clearly that they're derived from bacteria. Um, in contrast to our genome, which is packaged into chromosomes and is not circular, uh, bacteria, uh, sorry, mitochondrial DNA is circular. And it um, and so and and that's completely different to 
uh, the genome. Each of the genes also lack what's called an intron. Now, an intron in human in, in eukaryote genes, introns are very common. What it is is a a piece of DNA inside a gene that does not code for the protein. And while the gene is being convert, uh, uh, guiding the direction of protein, when an intron comes along, it's just, it, it, so when the RNA is synthesized from the DNA, the introns are, clear, are cut out. Okay, so it's, it's just a spacer of DNA. Um, I'm not up to speed on what the function of these is, but they're very common in in uh, eukaryotes. Um, but they're absent, completely absent in the genes in our mitochondria. Um, I mentioned earlier about codons. That's the three bases of DNA that code for a particular amino acid. There are subtle differences in the codons that are used in mitochondria, in our mitochondria, as opposed to our genome. And the subtle differences are similar to to bacteria and also the machinery of of um, copying the dna and converting the dna into um, using it to guide direction of amino acids and sorry assembly of amino acids into a protein that is also very reminiscent of bacteria so i guess the question there would be when there's all of this amazing machinery in our nucleus um, why does there, you know, it, it's it's such powerful evidence that our a very early ancestor of ours was a bacteria that was absorbed into our cell. When the machinery is already there in the nucleus, why wasn't that same machinery, which is spectacular, um, it even has error, um, proofreading, much better proofreading capability in the genome, um, but it's... it's uh, it's, we've just the, the 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 genome machinery and the way it functions is just entirely like a bacterial ancestor. So that, to me, when I first read about this, I just was absolutely blown away. It just showed very clearly the ties that we had to all living things on the planet on the planet very very long time ago. Um, and as I mentioned okay. earlier, I may I may have I may have realized I might have had that sort of wow moment as a very faithful member of the church and just um, conveniently put that one on the shelf i didn't think too much uh, more about it so i don't so know if you, you have any are questions you saying, are you saying we share ancestry with conifers basically in some, absolutely like all, all plants all animals and all fungi um, and that's, not, the, that's not theoretical that's literally we can find we can find Share DNA through analyzing the sequencing of the DNA of a conifer and our DNA, we can find the the um, similarities. Yes, yeah. Obviously, plants will have genes that are unique to plants, but there are whole hosts of genes to common metabolic pathways um, where there is just abundant similarity between plants. Um, and animals, all plants and all animals. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. I, I just, it's, I just was, I think that's a very powerful illustration of our con connectivity right through to the, the earliest um, plants and animals, not just the, you know, we're just related to, you know, primates yeah. and nothing else. Yeah. Um, where it, it connects us deeply into the tree of life on the planet. Some don't like that, but for me, it, it it's kind of beautiful that we all share. We're all kind of brothers and sisters, even with the plants yeah. and the animals, yeah. right? Yeah. For me. Yeah. Yeah. We might need to just move along a little. On, okay. We're a little behind schedule, but uh, if we hop on to the next slide. Now, um, I'll just give you a bit of background before we hop into this slide. This is a YouTube clip um, created by John Perry from Stated Clearly. Um, and it's a beautiful story of how we share um, basically fossil uh, virus fossils in our genome in exactly the same locations as chimpanzees. It's just be a beautiful story. And, um, so he talks about uh, endogenous retroviruses 
So HIV was a, ret a retrovirus. What that basically means is that HIV, in order to reproduce, it needs to hop in a cell and get into the DNA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Coronavirus doesn't get into your DNA. It's just a regular virus. It gets in to your cell and then reproduces. It's got its own uh, machinery for copying itself. Whereas HIV, a retrovirus, gets into your DNA. Well, there are endogenous retroviruses. All they are is just a virus has got into your DNA, but it's no longer functioning as a retrovirus. It's 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 sort of, I think it's a useful term, is is a virus fossil that's floating around, around in our, our genome. So, yeah, I might just get you to click that one into life, um, Gerardo, and yeah. we'll just sit back and relax for six minutes and watch an absolute master of um, animation uh, take us through this story. So how does this all act as evidence that humans, chimps, and other primates really evolved from a common ancestor? In 2003, the first draft of the chimp genome was published. Overall, chimp DNA and human DNA sequences are incredibly similar, but unless we dive deeper, this fact alone can't tell us for sure if evolution is a better explanation than the fixed species idea. We already know that humans and chimps have similar traits. If DNA codes for traits, we should expect our DNA to be similar as well, right? In many cases, this is a reasonable point, but not in the case of endogenous retroviruses. Remember, your endogenous retroviruses show you the unique history of specific virus infections suffered by your ancestors. They're like scars in our DNA that an individual acquires during its lifetime and can pass on to his or her descendants, but only his or her descendants. Here we're looking at maps of human and chimp chromosomes side by side. Chromosomes are the structures in our cells that contain our DNA. If humans and chimps share a common ancestor, and if at least some of the infections we find in our genome occurred before the chimp-human split, we should find the same virus genes in the exact same locations in both human and chimp genomes. In contrast, if humans and chimps are not related, they should not share the same history of virus infections. Now, of course, it is possible that throughout history, both species, humans and chimps, were infected by some of the same viruses. Humans and chimps sometimes get each other sick today. But if chimps and humans are not related, those virus genes will not be found in identical locations of both chimp and human DNA. This is because when a retrovirus infects a host, there are many different spots in the host genome where it might end up inserting itself. Extensive lab experiments with retroviruses have found that there are far more than 10 million possible insertion spots in the human genome. In other words, the chance of a human and a chimp getting infected in the exact same spot by the same specific type of virus is far less than one in 10 million. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> well, it's ridiculously unlikely and it gets worse fast. If two individuals are both infected with just 12 of the same viruses, the chance that each of those 12 inserted themselves into the exact same DNA locations in both hosts is less than one in the number of all the atoms estimated to exist in the entire observable universe. To get a rough idea of how many insertions are shared between humans and chimps, Researchers scanned both of our genomes looking for a type of retrovirus they knew was common in humans. They found 211 insertions in the human genome and 208 in chimpanzees. To figure out if any of these insertions are in the same locations in both humans and chimps, they compared the unique flanking DNA sequences on either side of each insertion. If you think of the virus as a scar, the flanking sequences are the healthy bits of tissue around the scar that tell you where the scar is located. They found that we share not just one, not just 12, but 205 insertions. 205 out of 214 for this particular virus group. This makes perfect sense if we consider the evolutionary view of life. The 205 shared viruses were inserted sometime before the chimp-human split. The six insertions unique to humans and the three unique to chimps either represent insertions that happened after the split, or they represent deletion mutations that removed a few viruses in just one lineage after the chimp-human split. In contrast, if we want to believe the fixed species view, we're forced to conclude that these viruses are simply shared by coincidence. When we do the math, even 
making sure to account for the nine viruses not shared by the two species. The chance of this happening by coincidence is less than one in this crazy number right here. This evidence should be enough for even the most reluctant yet rational person to carefully set aside the fixed species view. Endogenous retrovirus DNA alone is more than enough to independently confirm what we already knew from the study of fossils. That said, what we've seen here is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other lines of DNA evidence available. Together they demonstrate beyond all reasonable doubt that humans and chimpanzees did evolve from a common ancestor. We are family. Wow, case closed. Yeah, <laughs> that is oh, that is just so amazing. I mean, John is just a. Uh, beautiful storyteller and he gets the science so solid the research that he does with scientists in, is just incredible and uh and he's and he's ex-mormon and he's ex yeah he's very happy to come on the podcast at some stage john um he would have come on today except um he's just so got so many commitments on um but he, these take a lot of work these these videos and yeah. he's he's working on new ones all the time this is a this one's fairly fresh um and uh but yeah look i highly recommend his stuff because it's scientifically he's very um careful to be completely accurate so he he'll ring scientists up and say you know does this is this sound right so he, he double checks all of his stuff so but what a beautiful story um it just shows quite clearly that we are um we share a very common ancestor a very they're our closest living relatives um and we share we share ancestry with them. I think about eight million years ago. Um, yeah. Any any questions or comments? Further comments? No. On that. Oh, that's super cool. Okay, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Shout I think that's really useful background for what we're going to now talk about. We're just going to talk about um, the column, basically uh, the origin of our species, Homo sapiens. Our, our connection with other species that are ex are now extinct, although we do carry a little bit of them with us. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, so we, are, yeah, so we, there's now a complete scientific consensus um, that the origin of the human family is, is in Africa. Um, so, and there are four species that are listed on this side. So there's Homo sapiens, that's us, um, Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, and Denisovans. I think there's a little bit of debate as to whether or not erect, Homo erectus may actually be Denisovans. Um, I don't know. Um, Michael may have an opinion on it later on. Um, but the most widespread archaic relative of us is Homo erectus, who was found pretty much right across um, Africa, Middle East, and southern, you know, India and, and southern Asia, and down into um, Indonesia. Um, the earliest fossil Homo sapien is Omo 1 in the Rift Valley in, so in southern Ethiopia. Um, now, it was thought to be about 195,000 years old, but um, in a very recent paper, I think it was this year, earlier this year, they um, they redated the fossil because there was a layer of pumice um, immediately above the fossil, and they date this was from a volcanic erup eruption, and they matched up the volcano, mm. so the geochemistry of the soil that pumice layer was matched to a volcano, and they were able to I think it was through um, argon dating determine very accurately. So they grind up the the pumice. And then they, they uh, measure the argon-40 and argon-39 and determine when that eruption took place. Um, so that's now 230 years old is the um, – that's the minimum age for the earliest Homo sapiens. So it may be, may be quite, a, you know, maybe up to, up to 300 years old. Um, 
So the move out of Africa probably took in, it was probably around about 100, I can actually read the size of, I think it's about 150,000 years ago, about 100,000 years ago that humans entered the Middle East. Uh, and then the earliest humans, Homo sapiens in um, Europe are found about 45,000 years ago. And that's when they encountered Neanderthals. So Neanderthals were a, um, a, a, di a distant relative that had moved and colonised Europe uh, since about 800,000 years ago. And humans, there was an overlap of five to 10,000 years between Homo sapiens and uh, Neanderthals in Europe. And then uh, it's probably worth mentioning a at this point, the climate has been a very, um, we're all sort of focused a little bit on climate change at the moment. Well, climate has always been a problem for colonisation of the planet. Um, and about 40,000 years ago, just outside of Naples, um, there was a massive eruption. It's called the Campanian Ignebrite eruption. Uh, and it's the last, largest eruption in Europe in the last 200,000 years. And it pretty much killed anyone within a few hundred kilometres radius of the eruption and changed the climate. So it dropped the global climate by uh, at least a couple of degrees. And this probably contributed to uh, the demise of one of the things that contributed to the demise of uh, Neanderthals. Another thing may have been that their populations were too small and they, they started to inbreed. Um, so... Effectively, humans then shifted it back out of Europe. There might have been small corners of, say, southern Spain where they hung on. Um, I think there were. Uh, but then they moved back in after the end of the last Ice Age and colonised uh, Europe. Um, but meanwhile, humans moved east as well. So they're in the Middle East about 100,000 years ago and they shifted into, into uh, Asia so India and Asia about 75,000 years ago. And it's there that they encountered another species. Um, and we see signs of this species in our DNA. And we'll talk a little bit, bit more about that in a moment. Um, so it was about 50,000 years ago that uh, humans reached Australia and about 25,000 years ago when they reached um, the Americas. So if we hop onto the next slide... Um, this slide shows, I think, probably the, the sort of the major difference in the appearance of the Neanderthal skeleton, because we've got many Neanderthal skeletons and skulls now. Um, it has the Neanderthals had a slightly larger hindbrain compared to to Homo sapiens, which is a, a, a larger forehead. Um, that seems to be the major difference um, between the two. Um, yeah, and you know. There's, it's, it'd be fair to say that if, you know, if a, if a Neanderthal was alive today and dressed in regular clothes, you'd probably hardly even notice them. Oh. It wouldn't be, an, wouldn't be all that much difference between them, between them and, and the irregular, you know, crazy American or crazy Australian. Um, hey, watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so early on, there was, you know, this, image that they were sort of like a humpback and stooped and like, you know, an ape and whatever, but that's, that's absolutely nonsense. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of debate. If we go to the next slide, there was a lot of debate about, you know, are these guys in our, if, do we ever interbreed with these guys? Well, we now know for a fact um, that uh, humans interbred um, with Neanderthals in Europe and Denisovans in the East. Um, so there's just been some fascinating stuff that's been published just recently. They uh, isolated DNA from a 90,000-year-old um, individual, and in, I think it was in the Denisovan cave. Denisovan cave is a cave in Asia where they, the, the, that finger bone was found and they sequenced the, the genome. Well, there have been a lot of um, other skeletons that have been sequenced from that cave. They sequenced an individual's 90,000 years old and it had a Neanderthal mum and a uh, Denisovan dad. So it was a pure hybrid of the two. So they could clearly interbreed. Um, and uh, they've sequenced the earliest uh, 
genomes out of about five individuals in Europe that were 47,000 years old, and they could detect Neanderthal DNA there that had, re that had entered the family tree only a, about five or six generations earlier. So, so in other words, the individual, one of their great-great-grandparents was a... Um, had joined in the family tree. Um, so their DNA would have looked a lot different to us. So some of us, all of us, or many of us have traces of Neanderthal DNA, and that, that Neanderthal DNA is scattered as tiny fragments um, throughout most of our genome. Whereas this individual, was these individuals from 47,000 years ago, there were sizable chunks of Neanderthal DNA present. Um, and this is, there are fascinating things that are coming out of this um, because Neanderthals and Denisovans have lived in environments f uh, that are pretty hostile to humans for a long, long time. So it's possible um, and it's very likely that they, um, there's been evolution and adaptation and survival of people who have genes that are better suited to a particular environment. And it turns out that a, a gene called EPAS1, which influences um, a person's ability to adapt to a high altitude and live at high altitude, um, scientists first discovered this gene uh, back in 2010 before the Denisovan genome had been published. And they thought something amazing is going on here. This is an incredible selection going on for this gene. It was the most selected gene, intensely selected gene in, I think, in existence at that time. And then two years later, it was sequenced. The, gene, the Denisovan genome was sequenced, and it was found that the EPAS1 gene is a Denisovan gene, or a, you know, it's an allele of that gene. When I say allele, we all have two copies of every gene, one from our mum and one from our dad, and they're called alleles. Mm. So, so, so people in Tibet who live at high altitude have a much higher frequency of the Denisovan allele of the EPAS1 gene because it gives a survival advantage at higher altitude. And that's because Denisovans have lived in that area for a long time. Yeah. So that's a, a really fascinating little story. Um, and there, But there are other genes, uh, Neanderthal genes, that have been under selection, positive selection, because they give some sort of an advantage. So it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's really fascinating. So on this uh, slide, you can actually see that um, Asian, most Asians have tiny traces, you know, a couple of percent of uh, Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA. Europeans tend not to have Denisovan. They have Neanderthal DNA in their ancestry. Um, so Australians have Denisovan and Neanderthal. Africans have tiny traces of Neanderthal, which seems to come from back migration. Um, and of course, American Indians carry uh, Neanderthal DNA and tiny traces of Denisovan. Virtually all uh, the genomes they've looked at of, of uh, Native Americans have tiny traces of Denisovan. Yeah. Another piece of, uh, if we go to the next slide, another piece of evidence that's really difficult to reconcile with um, all of us descending from an individual lived 7,000 years ago is this the massive amounts of genetic diversity. There are just so many mutations. You can't sort of uh, trace them all back to one couple that lived 7,000 years ago where there's only four chromosomes for each, four copies of each of our chromosomes um, when you have the, just the massive diversity. So I've, I've got a tree here that shows them. Uh, they've, they've looked at the mitochondrial genome and they've determined how long ago was a common, the common ancestor of, of all human mitochondrial genomes, and that was about 200,000 years ago. Um, they often refer to that as the mitochondrial eve, but it's not likely to be a single individual. It's likely to be a sort of a, a, a small population of people that shared uh, all shared that, uh, carried that, that lineage. Um, so any questions on that before we, uh, invite our guest in? I was just, <clears throat> I was just going to say, yeah. and if, and if genetic material evidence wasn't enough, Simon, I'm going to guess that, um, that in addition, 
we have archaeological evidence, we have carbon dating evidence, we have all the different uh, dating methods, evidence, linguistic mm -hmm. evidence, uh, geological evidence. Just it's it's not just DNA genetics plus yeah. carbon dating that's going to validate. It's going to be all the other scientific disciplines that yeah. are probably in, in very core ways uh, agreeing and supporting each other in terms of uh, in terms of everything you've been saying today. Yeah, yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, consensus science. Uh, this what, I'm, what we're talking about here is the scientific consensus. And and really, to be honest, um, you know, BYU scientists, members of the church, faithful members of the church, that don't, that um, don't have any problem with all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's just so, so important. So it's not across, not terribly, yeah, not terribly controversial. Consensus um, across multiple disciplines. Multiple disciplines. That's something yeah. that I'm just yeah. uh, thinking. I know we're talking about Adam and Eve, but like, isn't it interesting mm -hmm. that we can trace just the smallest part of Neanderthal? neanderthal uh genes in, into you know like today's uh humans um uh, but then for some reason lehi's dna got so watered down in the last couple hundred yes. years yeah that we can't find it on the on the yeah on the native yeah now the apologists like to use the excuse because we don't have lehi's dna we can't we can't find anything right well if lehi had ancestors yeah that's that's what had that's how all this DNA works. You can learn an awful lot about our ancestry by looking at the living people today and their and their DNA. Yeah. Um, but at this point, I'm really really um, delighted to welcome yeah. Michael Westaway, Professor Michael Westaway from the University of Queensland, to our group. Hi, Michael. Um, got, have we got the audio going? Ah, uh, yep. Uh, should be able to hear okay. me. I really appreciate Michael joining us. Michael has just come back from Torres Strait. Um, and he might tell us a little bit about that, but uh, Torres Strait is a critical junction between Australia and uh, Papua New Guinea, and what, uh, obviously our past was connected. But um, so Michael is a, an archaeologist, but he's um, he's been drawn over to the dark side with genomics and DNA because it's just such a, a powerful tool. Um, and he's the author of a, a very highly cited paper in 2016 on the the genomes of Australian Aboriginals. And uh, voted a paper that was voted in the top ten, I believe, in Science, published in Nature. But um, the two scientific journals are very friendly to each other, and if they like a scientific article in the other journal, they'll they'll rave about it. So, um, and and it, maybe uh, uh, Michael will tell us a little bit about that. But um, yeah, I welcome aboard, uh, Michael. Um, I'll introduce you. To, you've probably seen a couple of other faces there, um, John. John DeLynn and uh, Gerardo. And Gerardo. Hi, Michael. Hey, Michael. Welcome. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Michael, I'd be just interested to hear you talk about um, how you got into archaeology, what drove that fascination, then maybe talk about your PhD research. And I hope you don't mind if we occasionally pop in and ask you a few more questions. If we, yeah, you've, of course. you've certainly had a fascinating uh last decade of research so um yeah so tell us a bit of what drove you and uh, about your phd work yeah well i i was always very interested in uh ancient history and studied that at school i grew up on the north coast of new south wales halfway between sydney and brisbane on the east coast of australia and um <clears throat> loved ancient history and thought i'd go and study uh near eastern archaeology uh and then i went to the australian national university in canberra and and had some remarkable teachers and uh, they introduced me to the archaeology of this continent which I was very naive about and uh, Isabel McBride who was the first professional uh, prehistoric archaeologist to work in Australia the female uh, uh, prehistoric archaeologist she did her um, work on the um, the archaeology of New England which is the north north coast of New South Wales and so she'd excavated all these sites uh, in my own backyard uh, where I'd grown up as a kid and I had no knowledge of the great antiquity of, of Aboriginal Australians. I was really that experience at the Australian National University, being taught by another man, Colin Groves, who was a, a, a leading sort of a, uh, well, primatologist and uh, biological anthropologist. Uh, mm -hmm. I studied my PhD under Colin. 
and I was inspired by these people by the um the, the information they presented on um you know the antiquity of uh, human origins in this area and and the the, the great span of time from the first colonization in Australia. Uh, so um, it was a pretty uh, inspiring environment, the Australian National University back in the early 1990s when I studied. I did my PhD uh, studying from about 2005 or 2004. Uh, I did it part time. And I decided to um, look into the question of uh, modern human origins in our region. That was a great time because it sent me all around the world to look at the earliest fossils of modern humans. So um, you mentioned Omo, and um, there's another site called uh, Jebel Uhud, uh, and there's a, another site, Laetoli, in uh, East Africa and Tanzania, and the um, fossils from uh, Israel-Palestine called um, uh, Shkul and Kafse. And so I, I went around the world to all the major museums studying these fossils to compare to the Australian record. And the, and the, the, the largest record uh, we have for fossil uh, ancestral remains in Australia is from a place called Lake Mungo, which is actually one lake in a chain of 13 ancient lakes. And it's a World Heritage Area called the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area. So um, I uh, actually uh, I took on a job to work in the World Heritage Area for four and a bit years. Uh, and I worked very closely with the, the traditional Aboriginal groups, the, the Barkindji, Muddy Muddy and Niampa. And uh, they gave me permission to study the fossils of their ancestors. Uh, so um, and this is an extraordinary place. The, the lakes, uh, it's a fossil lake system. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it hasn't actually been excavated by archaeologists. It's actually sheep that have played the major role in excavating that landscape. So uh, it's um, a, a large series of crescent-shaped dunes on the eastern margin of these ancient lakes. They're all dry today. Uh, we call these crescent-shaped uh, dunes lunettes. And they are layered up in, in different layers of time. And... Uh, the erosion that's been caused by sheep farming over the last 170 years has essentially um, removed all the vegetation and you see these deeply incised gullies cutting through uh, these uh, these lunettes, these crescent-shaped dunes. And as they cut through, you can see changes in sediment over time. And so you can see nice sandy layers, which represent the time when the lakes were full of water and uh, the, the wind blew the, uh, the nice beach sorted sands and they would blow up in a nice sand dune. When the lakes were dry, the, the, uh, the, um, the clay nodules would form uh, in the clay bottom of the lake and it would be blown by the same winds and it would form a, a clay layer. So you can see in the Willandra Lakes layers of sand, clay, sand, clay, and they reflect the time uh, of environmental change over some well, 140,000 years, uh, these dunes have been dated. In the last 50,000 years, we see evidence of humans interacting with that landscape. So we see extinct animals, and we dated the latest extinct animal, Zygomaturus, which is a massive wombat-sized marsupial, a bit bigger than a rhinoceros. Um, uh, these animals seem to die at around 30,000 years ago. Uh, so people coexisted with them in that landscape for 20,000 years. Uh, but um, the record continues for humanity, even at the peak of the last glacial maximum. So the last glacial maximum is, is the really bad ice age where sea levels drop 140 metres. Um, you see uh, what occurs is, uh, you know, with, with glacial increase this, uh, and the expansion of Antarctica, sea levels drop by 140 metres, so Australia becomes much more arid. Uh, we call the larger continent of Australia at that time Sahul, Sahul is connected to Papua New Guinea and to Tasmania. And so during that time, we see, uh, you know, that the, the ancestors of the Aboriginal people there today still thriving in that environment. I was very fortunate to be involved in about 2006, I think it was, the excavation of a fossil trackway site, um, uh, which showed, you know, family groups moving across this system at the peak of the last ice age. So Australia and that part of the continent at that time would have been more like out of Mongolia or Terra de Fuego. It was a very arid, cold place, uh, but still human populations thrived. So I had the great fortune of being able to study the ancestral remains of the, the current Aboriginal people there today. Uh, there are over 100 fossils from that landscape and more and more will be eroded over time. Uh, and I compared them to the fossil record across the globe uh, for my PhD of modern humans. Most of the modern humans dating from around 100,000 years ago uh, from Africa and 
and the Near East or the Middle East, as people more commonly know it. Then I also worked in a place called uh, Nandong in Java, and I excavated at that site. Uh, that's a, uh, the latest known Homo erectus site. So uh, there was a controversial paper published in Science in the late 90s, 96, I think, uh, by a chap by the name of Swisher, who argued that Homo erectus had survived until 27,000 years ago. So I, I, I worked in that site with uh, the now late Professor Jakob uh, and also Professor Baba from the um, National Science Museum in Tokyo. And we studied these fossils and we, we established that the age, uh, the very late age for Homo erectus was wrong. Um, and this undermined the idea uh, that, you know, these two species had coexisted for a long time. Uh, and I studied these fossils to try to see if we could establish traits of um, Homo erectus in the first Australians. When the first fossils were found in Australia in the early 1900s at a place called uh, Cow Swamp um, in uh, central Victoria, these were very heavily built, robust fossils. And so for many, many years, uh, paleoanthropologists like Alan Thorne um, believed very strongly that the origins of, of the first Australians was closely linked to Indonesia, the, arc of, the mark of ancient Java they referred to. But my PhD established uh, that there wasn't a mark of ancient Java, that the traits that we could see, the characters we could see in the first Australians were also seen in all these African early modern human fossils. Uh, so that was basically the, the, the sum result of my PhD. It was a huge body of work that took seven and a half years to complete while I worked part-time as a government archaeologist. But uh, it really inspired me. And, and because of that experience uh, and working with Aboriginal people and uh, working sensitively with their ancestors, uh, Australia has a, a bad past of stealing the remains of Aboriginal people and sending them to the museums across the world. A lot of people were uh, fascinated with the idea of the missing link and they thought that because um, early European observations identified what they called at the time a primitive culture that they didn't really understand, they uh, relegated them as a lower link on the evolutionary table. So museums across the world in the, in the, in the 1800s uh, wanted Aboriginal ancestral remains. And this, is, this is, has been a huge legacy of that um, science from the 19th century uh, and early 20th century. So uh, it's, it's, it is um, a lot of Aboriginal people are very suspicious of archaeologists wanting to study their ancestors, and it's understandable. Um, I've worked with lots of Aboriginal communities, and as you just mentioned a moment ago, Simon, I, I was in the Torres Strait helping a community who have their ancestors being washed into the sea as a result of climate change, and they want to work out how to to move this ancient cemetery site into a higher ground. Uh, so I work very closely with Aboriginal people to investigate their past by looking at the remains of their ancestors and, and helping them with, with current problems. Um, this experience uh, really uh, brought me to the attention of a number of people working in the ancient DNA. And uh, that's how I became involved uh, in, in collaborating with uh, geneticists to investigate the story. Um, so, you know, I, I investigated the story looking at the, the fossil record, the earliest modern humans and the, the earliest first Australians. Um, but there's only so much that the fossil can tell you. And uh, over the years, it's been revealed that we can recover ancient DNA from, um, from uh, fossil remains uh, if the conditions are right, but also more recent archaeological remains. But we can also study the, the DNA of living populations as well. And so... Um, uh, in um, 2016, I think it was, we re released the results of research that was actually looking at the diversity of modern DNA across Australia. Uh, that was led by uh, a very uh, well-known um, geneticist called Eska Villaslev uh, from uh, Copenhagen and Cambridge University. Uh, and Eska uh, is, is quite an extraordinary individual, about a year or two younger than me, and um, has written a huge number of nature and science papers studying the ancient DNA and modern DNA of populations across the world. Uh, and the, the work that he has done is really sort of changing our understanding of modern human origins. So while I, I couldn't detect signatures of admixture between other species of um, early humans with modern humans in our region, the DNA has revealed that signature. And in the first Australians, uh, we see evidence of uh, interactions with two populations. So everybody living outside of Africa today um, has in their DNA uh, the signature of, of past interactions with Neanderthals. 
uh, but two two percent of your DNA today is from Neanderthals. But the first Australians also carry the signature of a of intermarriage or interaction with uh, this enigmatic population called the Denisovans. Mm -hmm. We actually have very few fragments of their fossils. The main cave is uh, in Siberia called Denisova uh, Cave, um, and uh, there are quite interestingly in that cave the remains of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, so. The two species were interacting. Uh, modern humans moved to that area. Interestingly, we're now uh, finding uh, DNA uh, signatures of other Denisovan lineages. Um, one um, in Southeast Asia, the island Southeast Asia, around Indonesia, and there seems to be another one east of that uh, uh, in an area we call Wallachia, east of a place called the Wallace Line. The Wallace Line is like a biogeographical divide between the Asian plate and the Australian plate. So on, on this side of the world, our mammals are, are marsupials and monotremes, so kangaroos, koalas, and, and um, platypus and echidna. On the other side of the Wallace line, you get, uh, you know, monkeys. Um, there were uh, tigers. Um, there are elephants. It's a different fauna. So that these two these two land masses have been have been separated for at least fifty million years. Um, when modern humans move into this region, they cross east. Uh, heading east of the Wallace line and they move into the Australian continental plate and they meet, um, we think, uh, the, the, the ants, well, the, the Denisovans, another lineage of the Denisovans, and they also meet a, a very strange-looking um, fossil human uh, which was uh, coined the Hobbit, I think discovered in, or published in Nature in 2004. Uh, the real name is Homo floresiensis and this is a, a fossil... Uh, uh, that you know created a huge amount of debate. A lot of people argued, "Oh, look, this is someone with a, a congenital condition. It, it can't be a modern human. The dates are too late." Uh, this fossil actually looks like something you'd expect to see in Africa three million years ago, the Australopithecines. So the hobbits, yeah. Homo floresiensis, really shook up our understanding of modern human origins in this part of the world because there is there is interaction with these species. There's no evidence that they interbred. But there certainly seems to be evidence that there was intermixture with Denisovans. Yeah. So it's a really complex picture, the evolutionary story in this part of the world. Yeah. Oh, that that was fascinating, Michael. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, to hear somebody that sort of had such a long and uh, such a um, productive, you know, research experience in this field. Um, it's particularly relevant for our discussion because we've be, we've just followed the we're talking about how humans moved out of Africa and um, and your work and the, the work of others with you is just showing really quite clearly how humans have occupied this uh, Australia for such a long time. Um, if I, I wouldn't mind you just we. Uh, running through some of the slides that we had and just um, sure, sure. and having you just comment about some of these. The first slide um, I've stolen from your publication from 2016. And the thing that really stands out to me, because I've had such a focus on them, the origins of Native Americans and um, there's such enormous debate in America about whether humans have been there for 20,000 years or 30,000 years. And, and this slide just... Uh, shows how much evidence there is of human occupation in the Australia. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about that slide, the, the, the remains of that lovely slide that you had in your nature paper. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see uh, that the light green shading shows what the sea level was like uh, at the time yeah. of, of the, you know, the, the Pleistocene, the Ice Ages. So the sea level had dropped considerably, well connected to Papua New Guinea. So most mm. of the human history of Australia, the last 65,000 years, the majority of that time, Papua New Guinea has been part of the landmass. And you can see uh, across that region, there is a huge number of uh, uh, archaeological sites that date to greater than 40,000 years ago. Lake Mungo, you can see the the, um, the, the uh, white circle and the star. That's the area that I did my PhD research on. Uh, the sites uh, 10 and 11, uh, Majibibi, I think there's number 11, was excavated by a colleague of mine from the University of Queensland, uh, Chris Clarkson published in Nature a few years ago, and that's a 65,000-year site. Uh, so oh, that is the earliest evidence we have of human occupation. 
Um, and yeah. the people uh, at these sites, you know, the early archaeology at Majabibi, this site, um, in Arnhem Land, you know, there are there are ochre crayons and there are grinding fragments from um, seed grinding implements. So they're making bread. It's a fairly sophisticated group of hunter gatherers that um, yeah. colonised the continent at that early phase. And you know, these are the first. Uh, you know, these are the first real seafarers. They, they had to make a journey of at least around 120, 140 k's to get to Australia. And at that time, it would have been, you know, equivalent to a, a trip to the moon, you know, uh, to, yeah. to actually set off beyond uh, the horizon, knowing that there must be something else over those seas. So it's yeah. an extraordinary yeah. record and um, it's an incredibly rich one. And, and unfortunately, not all Australians appreciate it as, as we would like like to see uh in, yeah. in west australia just um uh a year a bit over a year ago um rio tinto a mining company destroyed one of these forty-seven thousand year old sites destroyed it with dynamite in that area they were doing mining and uh there was international condemnation and the 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 senior executives of rio tinto was replaced but uh you know it's an incredibly rich and important record but it's also something that we don't all appreciate as much as we should i think yeah. Michael, can I ask a, a question about that, your uh, nature paper? Um, I, you know, I don't think it was voted in the top 10 because it's got pretty pictures. It's probably because of the impact of the science. So in a nutshell, what was the what were the things that you've discovered that were just really fascinating? Well, it was at, at you know, it's the largest genomic study that's been done in Australia. There were 82 um, complete genomes, I think, from memory. Uh, from across the continent, uh, and it revealed a whole range of new insights into the population history of the country that you really can't recover through archaeological evidence alone. Archaeology can tell you when people are present. They, it can tell you when there's changes in material culture or adaptations to new environments. But, but what the genetic record said, and these are modern genomes, mind you, uh, it told us a lot about when people first arrived. It told us the, the timing of the interaction with Denisovans. Uh, which is around 40,000 years ago. And that was um, quite controversial at the time. But now that we're seeing Denisovans on this side of the Wallace line, on this side of the Australian plate, uh, with suggestions that they may have even been in the northern highlands of, of, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, you know, it's really uh, shaking up the way we, we think about origins in this part of the world. Yeah. But genetics yeah. also showed us that the um, divergence between Papuans and Australia occurred around uh, 27,000 years ago, which is much um, earlier than we thought uh, because the straits are cut off around 8,500 years ago. So the area between Papua New Guinea and Cape York, the northernmost part of Australia, is cut off 8,500 years ago. But the people actually diverged, you know, 27,000 years ago. Um, but we also see evidence of, um, uh, you know, population structure and divergence between East and West Australia at the peak of that last glacial phase. So when the country yeah. starts to really dry out, you don't see hardly any gene flow between the East side of the country and the Western side. And so those populations are, are more divergent uh, than Alaskans and people living on yeah. the, the other side of the, um, the Bering Strait. Cause then, yeah, because Central Australia is a pretty desolate place, isn't it? It's very hard to... Oh. It's a desert place now, but during yeah. the last glacial maximum, there was absolutely no water. There were, it was a massive barrier to any movement. Yeah. So we see yeah. this structure forming across Australia, and it's, you know, it's um really opened up our eyes as to the power of DNA to reveal things that you know you can't basically recover yeah. in the archaeological record. Yeah. So I was sold. You know, it was a, it was a my, my main role was working with Aboriginal communities, talking about the research, collecting yeah. the, the genomic samples, and then putting the genomic res results into the archaeological context of the continent. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's easy to see how crucial your archaeological work was for the in for that publication, um, hence the, you know, first, author first authorship. So that's beautiful work. I've, we've got a couple of other pictures that I might just, we might flick through and, and, and you might want to say a couple of things about them. But um, I actually visited uh, Lake Mungo um, about 18 months ago with my son, and he's a photographer, and I, I forgive me for not using one of his photos, um, but it's actually a beautiful uh, landscape. Um, yeah. And in this, and in this slide, you'll see, you can see the multi layers that you were talking about. 
And I've actually walked up. I, I was uh, fascinated to hear you talk about those narrow canyons you go up. You can mm. see all the layers. Well, I did all that. Um, yeah. But um, there you can see Mungo, the original excavation of Mungo Man, I think, which was, was that 1976? Uh, 74, Mungo it's Man was excavated. Uh, yeah. And Mungo Woman is 1968. So Mungo, they're both now established to be around 42,000 years old. Mungo Woman yeah. uh, was is the world's earliest cremation, so she was a cremated individual. And Mungo Man, uh, you can see some, um, just below his uh, skull, you can see some red staining. And so he was adorned in a huge quantity of ochre, which came from the Barrier Ranges, we think, over 200 kilometres away. So it's a, he's obviously a very significant individual that was adorned in, yeah. in ochre from a long way away. But um it's the, uh, it's the beautiful uh, sands of the Willandra and at the time there was uh, water on either sides of these lakes and, and the water would move through the sand dunes and, and slowly fossilise these, these remains. Um, yeah. that it's not been possible to recover ancient DNA from these early people because their, their, their bones, there's not much collagen left, they've all been heavily mineralised. DNA has been recovered from one yeah. individual, uh, WH4, and he's, he's probably only you know, in the last thousand years. But um, these very ancient ones, we haven't been able to recover their DNA. But, uh, you know, he's, he's the poster child, child Mungo man of, of the Pleistocene Australians. But the reality is there's another hundred individuals in that landscape, uh, at least. So it's, uh, it's an incredibly yeah. rich place. Mm. Yeah. No, it's a, a beautiful place. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and, of course, there was a little bit of controversy over the age of Mungo man. Um but uh, that seems to have been completely resolved um, yeah. using really neat technology. But yeah, we've got an, we've now got a footprint. We're going to actually talk about footprints in America in a moment. Um, but this is some a footprint that um, was this the one-legged man? <laughs> this is the one-legged man. Yeah, this is an extraordinary <laughs> story. There are over eight hundred fossil footprints at this site, and we published a paper in Australian Archaeology several years ago, refining the age to around nineteen thousand years or something but um these are people living at the peak of the last ice age and um we have over 800 footprints that have been exposed in this site mm -hmm. uh and um <clears throat> there are actually is a, a family group moving um west to east and uh the, the interesting thing about that is there's a child meandering behind them and then you see the child wandering off in his own direction heading back west it's almost like you can imagine the mother calling to the child and the, the child scampers after the rest of the group. So yeah. you get these really personal insights into family groups at the peak of the last ice age. Um, but, you know, then another group comes perhaps a few days later. We can't actually uh, refine the chronology that well. But um, they are a hunting group and they're pursuing something. And um, we actually got some uh, trackers from the Pinterby. And the Pinterby trackers are... Uh, uh, are quite famous in Australia. They were brought in in the 1960s and they had hardly seen any Europeans and their tracking skills were remarkable. They could tell if someone was carrying a kangaroo on their shoulder, then swap shoulders. They could see the change in weight distribution of the footprints. Oh, uh, and, and we were trying to work out how on earth is there just one foot? Maybe it was a shallow pond, we thought, and that's someone scooting along on a, on a, on a raft or something. But they pointed out the very obvious thing that his footprint was much, much deeper uh, than the other footprints. And they said there's a lot more weight bearing on that one footprint. And they said this is a one-legged man. And they said we had a one-legged man in our group who just died two weeks previous to their visit, and they believed it was the same person. It was it was the connection between the two. And you know, it was just this incredible event where they connected. Uh, and uh, they said this is an individual who's pursuing something. And they found where he'd thrown his stick, and then he took off on one leg pursuing some kangaroos. Oh, wow. So, it's um it's a remarkable story. They even picked up uh, uh, places where they were walking and they started laughing. They were speaking in language where someone had thrown a spear and missed the prey. Uh, so um, an incredible story came out from traditional knowledge that um, that archaeology had no chance of revealing. So that was really quite an amazing sight. Yeah, yeah. No, that's beautiful. It's nice to hear the you know the humanness of these people. You know these were I mean the fact that this mungo woman um was you know these are carefully buried these are yeah these people cared about their ancestors who died and they went to extraordinary lengths yeah. to adorn them um yeah so it was yeah what is really interesting i think is that there are you know there are a large number of cremations i think there are 14 cremated individuals and they range from 
males and females to children. So quite often in archaeology and anthropology, we say, oh, you know, funeral rites are only afforded to very significant individuals. Complex funeral uh, mortuary rituals are afforded to really, you know, high profile males and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you see children that have been cremated and afforded these complex mortuary rituals as well. So it's, uh, it's you know, it's, um, you know, and to, to see something like the fossil trackway, which is a very... Um, you know, a, a real living site. Uh, it uh, provides a glimpse that you really get in studying the archaeology of the Pleistocene. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I just thought just before we um, let you go, Mike, we certainly really appreciate your time. It's been a wonderful experience listening to you talk about your your work in such a sort of a emotive way. But um, I I dug around and found some literature about some cave art and. Uh, I think this is um, for those who are listening. You may want to pop in and see that, have a look at the visuals here. But there's some beautiful cave art of of uh, kangaroos that was painted um, about six, uh, six, seventeen thousand years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, the scientists very cleverly dated this by um, there were mud wasps that built nests, and some of them in the cave, and some of the nests were underneath the art. So the artists had painted over the top of them. Mm. And then there were mud wasps on the top, and they uh, they carbon dated the little remains of carbon that were in the mud wasp nests to determine how old they were. And I think yeah. it's, it's certainly the I think that's the oldest uh, rock art in Australia. I don't know that it's the oldest in the world though. Yeah, yeah. There's some earlier art in Sulawesi to the north in Indonesia, uh, yeah. which dates to around forty thousand. But here they um very cleverly were able to date organic material in the wasp nests and yeah. um. Uh, bracket of wasp nests on either side of the art, so yeah, uh, nests can be painted over and then nests again. So it's a it's a really clever paper. It's a nice bit of scientific research. Yeah, uh, I think that was only published just last year. Yeah, yeah. So we we might have links to that. Some of these you can't actually get. There's a paywall, but um, yeah. And we might just flick to. There's a couple of slides there, but we might click to, um, the last slide that we have, which is about the uh, colonization of the Americas and um run through this while you're here with us michael because it's a it's also a fascinating story about human footprints preserved in a lake in uh, new mexico and uh so this was uh, published in science and it's mm. the earliest firm evidence we have of humans in the americas there was a lot of debate you know was it was 15 17 000 years ago years ago based on archaeology and dna and then here this comes along boom um yeah, very accurately yeah. carbon dated um and revealed some really fascinating stuff so the carbon data that it went through similar things i think to the mungo lake where yeah. dry periods when you had sand and then uh, so, and then you had grass growing and that grass dropped lots of seeds and so they had these neat layers of seeds pods from i think it's ditch grass yeah ditch grass and they just be got really accurate carbon dates from that um so that was fascinating they also found mastodon footprints um, alongside the humans and a canid footprint. So that's either a wolf or a fox or a dog. And I'm tempted to believe, I don't know what your opinion would be about that, Michael, but is there much chance of it being a dog? Um, uh, I think well, dogs, yeah, dogs are domesticated quite late in the piece, uh, and we know that from the genetics. So, uh, you know, wolves are the ancestors of dogs, so it's probably uh, something along those lines. I mean, it's interesting that the scientists have sort of who've put this forward paper forward have argued that they need to do further osl dating as well they're very excited yeah. by the results and a, a lot of people seem to be in agreement with them now but um yeah you know when you want to confirm something i mean if you can apply in a technique uh, like osl dating uh, where we date the sand grains the last time they were exposed to sand uh, to sunlight yeah. uh yeah. that would be another way of verifying this but you know these are results that can be further checked and analyzed yeah, and yeah. it does push back the pre-clovis occupation of america by a few thousand years, and it's a really exciting discovery. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's more to come out. Yeah, well, that's fair. it's interesting you giving us a little insight into how science works. So this comes out, it, it uh, breaks a, it's a paradigm breaker or threatener, and uh, other scientists will come along and, and if they don't believe it, they'll go and use another technique to see if they can verify that age. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, I thought there was a nice connection through to your your footprint work in uh, in Australia. Yeah. Well, thank oh, you. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. No, it's thank all you very much, Michael. Michael. But before you leave, is it okay if I ask you just a final quick set of questions? Is that okay? Absolutely, John. Yep. Okay. No so again, I'm I'm John. It's so nice to have you on Mormon Stories. It's a real honor. And I'm really grateful, Simon, that you would bring Michael on. So Michael, we've just spent a couple hours now really kind of laying out the science between what, what Simon has said and you have said, Michael. There's going to be, you know, we also live in kind of a TikTok and an Instagram world where we create shorts and... Uh, and so what I want to do just right before you leave is just ask you a few really quick questions. And I just want to be clear, what we really value about you, Michael, is you're, from a Mormon perspective, you're an outsider. And so we know that scientists generally don't like to be brought into religious debates or faith debates. And even though scientists may have their own views, secular or religious, um, you know, we, we, we also... Um, you know, as, as people within a faith tradition, it's really valuable. Sometimes we get in our own silos of understanding. Sometimes we tend to just communicate with each other. And then when we have sort of a scientific minded person like Simon Southerton, who comes out of our tradition, who then has critiques, you know, those, uh, sometimes those scientists get labeled as apostates and get excommunicated be as a way to discredit them. So for us, whether it's Dr. Michael Coe or Dr. Robert Ridner, it's been the it's been the tradition of Mormon stories, you know. Whenever we were able to find a, a scientist who works outside of the tradition, who's willing to sort of just give us the understanding of the general scientific consensus, not as someone tainted like you know Simon, who's an evil apostate by, you know, by by Orthodox Mormon standards, and again, not to have you, Michael, be someone who's trying to take away faith or destroy faith or even weigh in on the debates. We're not asking you to do that per se, but what I'd like to do is just ask you to summarize your understanding of the general scientific consensus around a few of the major points that we're discussing today. So can we do a quick couple minute firing round, Michael? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, so first of all, the idea that the earth is, 7,000, let's just say 7,000 years old or 14,000 years old. What was your understanding as an outsider scientist as to the scientific consensus around, you know, that, that claim? Uh, well, the world, um, well, we do have an extensive fossil record now uh, that shows, um, you know, ex extensive change and evolution over tens of millions of years. So, um, uh, my specialty is is looking at the modern human story, uh, and that's what I can speak about with some confidence. And we know that uh, the earliest uh, human fossils now are found in actually northern Africa, Morocco, at a place called Jebel Urud, and they date to around 300,000 years. There are other early moderns at Omo and other sites that are around 200,000 years. Uh, so our species has a very old antiquity, and we know uh, by looking at the layers in the rocks how deep these fossils have been discovered and the discovery adjacent to extinct animals that no longer exist with us today. We know that the relative age of these fossils is very uh, is, is quite old. Um, we now have many scientific techniques of dating and it's not just relying on one or two. There are multiple avenues of inquiry that geochronologists, the people that study the age of ancient fossils, can apply to understand the antiquity of fossils. And these techniques are developed and they're critiqued by scientists all across the globe. So it's a system of regularly checking and rechecking the results and critiquing the science. It's very clear that modern humans have a, have a great and ancient antiquity that really we should all celebrate. And the first Australians, and we talk about faith-based um, conflict, uh, you know, the Aboriginal people believe in something called the dreaming, where they're their ancestry is closely tied to the land that they lived in. Uh, but many Aboriginal Australians are now realising that there's carbon time and dreaming time talk about similar concepts, you know. Um, we talk about uh, a time that occurred very long ago, tens of thousands of years, and in the case of Australia, now 65,000 years. We have a rich record in Australia of an, around 40 sites that now date to beyond 40,000 years. So... Uh, the record in Australia is strong, uh, it's it's inspiring, and many Aboriginal Australians don't see that as a threat to their, their religious beliefs. Um, they actually see it as a way of confirming that, you know, they have a long connection to the land and their stories aren't necessarily 
uh, in competition. I love it. Okay. And so the, the earth has to be older than seven or 14,000 years. Then obviously the idea that all humanity today sprang from a, a single uh, man and woman uh, about 7,000 years ago, I'm, I'm asking you to kind of repeat yourself, but your understanding of that, the, the possibility of that being our origin would be? Well, uh, in Africa, North and East, we see anatomically modern humans evolving uh, over 200,000 years ago. So, and this is also now supported by genetic evidence suggesting that our lineage's antiquity is that long too. So not only do the fossils and the archaeology associated with the fossils, but also the DNA of modern humans, they show this story of um, our ancient origins in Africa. Okay, and then you're being really you're being really generous and patient. So, um, do you do you have a quick personal feeling about the probability of of a global flood happening, where water covered the whole earth during around the time the Bible would claim Noah? Do you have any Do you have any thoughts or experience around the possibility of that, really quickly? And then I'll just have one more quick question after that. Uh, well, um, you know, we know that sea levels are changing today, and I've just come back from the Torres Strait Islands looking at some ancestral remains of some aboriginal groups who are uh, you know, eroding into the sea so in the past there were changes in sea levels but um there is no evidence suggesting that there was one great cataclysmic event that wiped out um you know huge numbers of different species uh and that humanity escaped um on a large floating vessel i think you know the geological and archaeological record push back in tight and deep time over a couple hundred thousand years showing our evolution is com complex and there were catastrophes in the past. There's something called the Mount Toba eruption that happened uh, in northern Indonesia. And, you know, it spread volcanic ash across much of Asia, but humanity survived that. So humanity has been able to survive many cataclysmic events um, and there are always environmental impacts, but, uh, yeah, I, look, I, I can't see any evidence for a cataclysmic event that, you know, wiped out all this, these species and then resulted in, uh, you know, an exodus in a, in a vessel that, that saved a couple of individuals and then they repopulated the world. It's, um, it, it doesn't really add up against the science. Okay, and then this is this question's a little bit outside of your geographic expertise, but the idea that, you know, North, Central and South America was populated primarily by um, Hebrews, that sailed to the Americas around 2,600 years ago and that they have kind of a, a Middle Eastern or even a Israeli origin to, you know, as, as the primary ancestors of the Native Americans, your, your thoughts around that? Yeah, well, there's fairly clear evidence in the archaeological record that the um, uh, people have populated the Americas in the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene is the last ice ages, which are over 10,000 years ago. Uh, and the, there is DNA from uh, people like Kennewick Man. And Kennewick Man is one of the earliest burials. Um, he dates to, I think, around eight or 9,000 years. Kennewick Man has um, Asian DNA. Uh, and we know that the, the people who populated the Americas and the, the uh, descendants who live today, uh, the Native Americans, um, are descended from these um, East Asian populations. So genetics and archaeology... Uh, don't really support the idea that there was a um, a population of people uh, from from you know the Middle East that colonised the Americas. And to what extent is there any evidence that Dr. Simon Southerton bribed you in his evil ways <laughs> to persuade you to state these things, or do you state these as an independent? Uh, I do uh, state these as independent um, <laughs> uh, scientists. And look, I I, I must apologise to Simon because I've been tripping all over the country at the moment. I've missed me emails and phone messages. So, yes, <laughs> uh, I've been hard to catch. So uh, I'm grateful that I've made it to the show today. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about these sort of things. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for being a good sport. Yeah, the bribes no are in the yeah, emails. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> What's that, Simon? Thanks very much, Michael. That was wonderful. Really appreciate no it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Simon. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. Michael. Goodbye. Bye. Wow, that was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I could, I could have listened to Michael fine. Thanks, for, for you. I, 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 I knew he'd had a fair bit of uh, breadth of experience, but um, 
Yeah, no, he's he's just been so intimately connected with um, the work done in Australia, and I I thought it'd be valuable to put this in as a little story and get go into a fair bit of depth here because I don't think uh, Americans hear too much about the debate about you know when did humans reach the Americas? Yeah, and and it's still debatable. You know, twenty thousand years ago, um, and here that illustration from his nature paper, you've got. 18 sites, archaeological sites across Australia where they have firm evidence, you know, rock tools and no, not bones of humans, but, you know, human art and, and tools that are over 40,000 years old. So um, it just shows you just how how much evidence there is for human occupation of Australia, which is a, a really important part of the story. That's why that paper was voted so highly that year. So... Um, but yeah, look, I, I just love the way he talked so passionately about um, his science, and it, you can tell that he's um, just loves what he's doing, and he's not motivated by trying to harm anyone's faith. It's just motivated by trying to find the truth. So yeah, I'm really, really um, grateful to him for that. So are you saying, Simon, that he doesn't start with a conclusion and then and then fits the evidence he finds? <laughs> no, well, I, I, it's it's interesting how some of his work in, um, yeah, I mean, scientists tend to view the consensus as something to to challenge. Yeah, yeah, it was so way. interesting that he said, you know, that yeah. he, that was he wanted to challenge what the consensus was, or what, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and and bad science is when a scientist will set out to prove a conclusion that he's already reached um, yeah yeah and uh so but um a bit. yeah it, it was it was it was wonderful to to hear an archaeologist um and to hear how how the molecular work has complemented his, his work so so well um yeah and no, I'm, I'm really it was wonderful to have him on all right, we're going to change gears now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have some some questions raised by science. Yeah, like let's we've got a um, I don't know. Do you want to do you want to? There's a bunch of questions, obviously, that are raised by the yeah. science. Um, why do our my, why do our mitochondria look and behave like they were once bacteria? Um, yeah. Why do we look like we're related so distantly to everything else on the planet, every other living thing? Why do we share so much fossil, you know, fossilized virus with our closest living relative? Um, how can Australian Aboriginals and Native Americans descend from Adam when they have been separated from uh, the rest of the, the global population for from twenty five thousand to sixty thousand years? Um, yeah. How do we explain fossils that are 40,000 years, 230,000 years old? And as Michael said, potentially up to 300,000 years old are fossil humans. <clears throat> yeah. Do spirits make fossils? Do, what were these pre Adam beings like? Um, and how, of course, how do we explain the presence of Neanderthal DNA and Denisovan DNA in us today when they went extinct? Um, in the case of Denisovans, it's about 60,000 years ago or uh, potentially 40,000 years ago, I think, um, uh, from Michael's work. Um, but uh, generally, they were mostly extinct by 60,000 years ago, but, you know, 35,000 years ago for Denisovans. So um, these are all serious um, questions that are raised by the science. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how is it that, you know, all non-Africans have two to three percent of Neanderthal DNA. Yeah. yeah. So these are just really serious questions. Um, and there are scientists at BYU that are grappling with them and um, don't. Well, I, yeah. Yeah, there's this quote, right, uh, from Dr. Michael Whiting. On yes. Twitter. Um, and he says, nothing has been more destructive to our students than giving them an ultimatum. They must either believe the gospel or believe in evolution. Hmm. And, and that was on the BYU, BYU Maxwell. Twitter page, yeah. 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 So, 
Um, I've got, got absolutely no doubt that all of that stuff that we've just talked about, um, Michael Whiting would accept because I believe he's a competent scientist. He yeah. teaches human evolution. And you know, one of the comments is there from one of his students, obviously learning about ancestors, learning about my ancestors with Dr. Michael Whiting. And there's a what looks like a skeleton of a chimpanzee. So yeah, we, it's, it's clearly that we uh, um, descend from common ancestor. Um, the, now, the next um, slide, I... Michael Whiting wrote a, an essay back in 2011, which was published in a lecture on science and religion series published by BYU. And uh, so he talks very passionately about evolution and he clearly um, believes it um, is true. Um, but then at the end of this essay, he has the hard questions. And it's what we're talking about yeah. today yeah. that he uh, does not answer. He, he can't answer. He's not delved into pre-Adamites or death before the fall. Um, and he makes the observation that, you know, the evolutionary theory can be spun in such a way as to be in direct conflict with the doctrines of the church. Um, I don't think there's any spinning going on. Yeah, I don't think we've spun, spun any any of the scriptures that you present. Yeah, that you present no it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and he says that there are interpretations of Latter-day Saint scripture that can be formulated in such a way as to contradict current ideas and evolutionary theory. I just think there are conflicts and there yeah. is no resolution. And we're going to talk, um, just to, to, to wrap up, we're going to look at some of the comments that have been made uh, more recently by LDS apologists to, to look at just, which I think illustrate the, the quandary that they're in. Um, and yeah, the first com comments that I want to look closely at are, comments of a 20 from a 2017 interview with um this was on the gospel tangents uh, website where hugo perego was interviewed hugo perego got his phd at um uh, i think it was byu and has done a lot of work on the mitochondrial uh, dna of um, american indians and uh he's he's italian so he's a little bit disjo uh, he's he's um i might read this out because it's a, a little um sometimes it's a little bit um yeah he didn't write this he, he was speaking about it right he so was, he, it was inter about. being interviewed yeah yeah this is so he's asked about um you know human evolution and he clearly believes it and he says that's what genetics says that's what the dna says okay archaeological evidence is the same carbon dating is the same fossil record strata whatever discipline you take and you look at it there were people living on the earth, humans living on the earth for hundreds of thousands of years, 200,000 years for our species. But so clearly he accepts all of the stuff that we've just talked about. I mean, that's basically a summary of what we've talked about. Fossil yeah. strata, DNA, genomics. And then he says, this is where it gets problematic. Can all these data from different fields be affected by outside environmental happenings like volcanoes, a catastrophe, a meteorite? A flood and everything looks a lot older than it is absolutely <laughs> that is problematic yeah Big problematic is he saying two things at the same time that that he is saying that you can jam this whole two hundred thousand years into a seven thousand potentially if there was a catastrophe of sufficient magnitude i don't know what particular catastrophe that could be but he's giving Bear in mind that Hugo Prego is not a scientist now. He is a CS instructor in Rome. He's employed by the church. Mm -hmm. And to me, he is just speaking to the church. He is giving them all an out. Yeah. There's an, there's an es escape clause here. Um, yeah, look, it might look this way, and I don't have it. This is what I believe. Uh, but it, this is, it seems to be his style, right? Because that's how he wrote the DNA Lemonite. Uh, Book of Mormon essay, yeah. which we know he was the one in charge of. He was the main uh, author of the uh, Book of Mormon uh, DNA essay. Right. And he writes like three or four different, about three or four different ways in which he thinks there, there could be an out to the, hmm. to the evidence, right? But yeah, I mean, you've talked about this extensively on Mormon stories, how any of the theories that he puts out really holds any water and there's no way that 
the the theories that he he tries to put forward um could really explain away why why there's no no any hebrew dna in, in native americans mm, yeah we'll get we'll um I'll, we'll do an episode uh, entirely on um, american indians in the future yeah. and that's gonna that's where i'll uh, talk about some of the similar sort of approach that he's taking in the dna essay right um just just uh, he's just miss i think he he's sort of misleading people because um yeah but i in this particular interview, I think I'm, it's really quite disappointing to see that he's um, claiming that all of this variation in the human genome, all these fossils, all that sort of stuff, it, it could act, it could be the result of a, a uh, an asteroid or a meteorite or a volcano. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's quite disappointing. Here's another quote, um, right? Yeah. So if we go on to the next page, there's some uh, um, some more quotes. Um, because Hugo, was in, he was intimately involved with the uh, publishing quite a lot of work that proved that the DNA of American Indians uh, clearly showed that they'd been in the Americas for uh, 15,000 years. And uh, I might just read the first one out and then perhaps, perhaps you could read the second one um, Parado. Yeah. Uh, can there yeah. have been people living in the Americas 15,000 years ago pre flood, pre Adam time? And the answer is why not? Because the church does not have a position about who lived before Adam and Eve, uh, in spite of all the things that we've read in the scriptures. Right, right. We know through Revelation there wasn't Adam and Eve. We know that there were all descend that we're all descendants of them, but the church has never said there was nothing before. Hmm. <clears throat> In the next section, which you, perhaps you could read out, Gerardo, he talks about um, yeah. how that, he thinks it might have worked out. Yeah. Could it have been that there was some human-like individuals under the direction of Heavenly Father and that he is involved in the creation of the heirs over really billions of years? There was some sort of evolving process that was utilized to create what we have today. And then at a certain point, a spirit was placed into this already existing physical body. So he's kind of like asking questions, right? Like saying, "Yeah, like is it possible that God used evolution, and then finally, when when Adam and Eve were ready, or the evolution yeah. was sufficient, then he, mm -hmm. then he put a, a spirit inside their bodies." Seven thousand years ago, right? I mean, I guess that with God, any anything's possible. Just to play devil's <laughs> yeah. advocate, is that right? <laughs> We're getting well, the into the... Is that you have scripture saying that there was no death yeah. before Adam. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then we have all the fossils, but but he's trying to say that the church has no position, but the, the scriptures are very, very clear. So he's ignoring, yeah. he's lying, because the church clearly has a position when canonized scripture says very, very clearly that there there was no death before Adam, yeah. uh, claiming that the church has no position. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's not it's not being. Yeah honest yeah um to be fair to you go this is in an interview and he's on the he's speaking on the cuff so i um yeah probably probably saying he's lying might be that's a bit probably a bit unfair but uh, but i think as we've discussed there's clearly a problem the problem is how do you reconcile the scripture which is really quite explicit um and yeah how do you say something that can maintain to people's faith and uh, the last slide which we'll move on to is is a um, a fair mormon uh, attempt to reconcile uh, some of these uh, the problems of the that we've been uh, we've been talking about so for those who aren't familiar fair mormon is pretty much now the major apologetic uh, one of the major apologetic organizations dealing with the clash between Mormon doctrine and science. Um, having said that, it's uh, unofficial um, and anonymous. This is something that uh, I am find quite troubling. They will write all of these apologetic defences and there's no name, there's no author and there's no date. And so if somebody comes along and criticises something they say, they can just go out and change it the next week and you you won't, no one will realise it. Yeah. So, but I I ran I read through a uh, 
the, one of the most uh, the current uh, fair Mormon sort of response to some of these the questions that we've been dealing with. Um, Adam and Eve are historical people. That's clearly what the, the doctrine says. And uh, he says there's no way to locate them in any scientific way because we can't we haven't got their DNA. This is like the Lehi, the Lehi excuse. We haven't got Lehi's DNA, so we can't find his descendants. Yeah. <laughs> Your current the contemporary, the DNA in contemporary populations comes from those ancestors. Um, so I find that really problematic. The, the fall about 7,000 years ago, uh, they, they're they even trying to wiggle their way out of that one. As I said earlier, that was a Q&A. Joseph Smith was asking God to clarify something he was uncertain about. I don't, why would God come back with a figurative, wishy-washy, vague response? <laughs> it's quite clear in section yeah. 77, verse 6, that um, Adam and Eve live 7,000 years ago okay to get around the no death before the fall is quite a novel one here they've come up with um mm. it may or may not have been limited to the garden so there might oh. have been there might have been a garden where there was no death but all around them outside of the garden is the world <laughs> i hadn't heard there. that one before yeah so joseph fielding smith is turning over in his grave <laughs> <laughs> um and then they say in response to the Garden of Eden, there doesn't seem to be any requirement for us to believe that God created a literal garden. What? Ooh, boy. It's Except for the fact that Joseph Smith basically <laughs> said it was in Missouri. Yeah. Right? And that's what Adam the I don't the think where Adam dwelt. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this in the previous episode. Yeah. It's quite explicit. <laughs> it's Missouri. Yeah, even um, the I, I actually looked it up. Adam was an, Adam was an American. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I looked it up like a couple of days ago on the church's website. It, it says still till today that the, the they the church believes that the Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri. So it's not something that they are shying away, but Fair Mormon is. Yeah, so that's interesting. But this is what this is. Uh, this is so typical. We we might just finish off. This last one. After the fall, Adam and Eve mixed with other extant populations or were given bodies of that extant population and with each relationship began to bring God's children into the world, thus being the father of us all. Yeah, okay. So, but the, the, the crux of the problem for me is this stuff is written and it's hidden away. It's unofficial. It's anonymous. Um. Yeah. And they have absolutely no authority to speak for the church unless and until the senior leaders of the church grapple with the challenge and the problem. I just It's just going to stay in the same way it is now. And this holding pattern that we're in now where, you know, the, the, the fundamentalist beliefs are perpetuated in public meetings and blah, 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 and, the, you know, the... the um, Malu of, of church, and then, oh, if you've got a problem with any of this, go and talk to our apologists. And you go to the apologists, yeah. and they're just talking a different language, they're reading different scriptures, <laughs> and they can just completely and utterly dismiss something from scripture. Yeah. That's absolutely black and white. Yeah. And they find. So as I read through this document, I was just blown away by the number of times I read language like, uh, presented as a metaphor, flexible understanding, may or may not be, possibly this, could have been that. Um, <laughs> just, yeah. And it, to be fair to these guys, they're in a predicament. They're in a really difficult situation. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't like to be trying to defend uh, and wiggle my way out of the problems that they've got uh, to be faced with. For for me, the problem with with Mormon apologists is they they have to reinterpret and nuance to the point where words don't mean anything anymore, where the quest the value of prophets and scripture dwindles yeah. to almost nothing, because if they can just say, well, they were speaking as a man there and there and there and there, and the scriptures are not to be taken literally there and there and there and there, well, if that's the way you're approaching scriptures and prophets, all of a sudden. Uh, they're not worth a whole lot unless yeah. you're just saying 
when, when the prophets, seers, and revelers say, be good, be nice to people, be good to people, be kind. Mm -hmm. And you don't really need prophets to tell you that. Oprah and Dr. Phil uh, are, are able to say that. So mm -hmm. That's the problem with apologists, I think. Plus, they're contradicting mm -hmm. very definitive statements made by prophets, seers, and revelators in scripture that all mm -hmm. out, outrank them. So who are apologists to, to supersede scripture and prophetic utterances? They're, they have no authority, like you said, Simon. Yeah, yeah. And they're twisting words, you know, translate doesn't mean translate anymore. And yeah. Yeah. It just gets um it just gets exhausting. Yeah. Well, that's my last slide. Apart from the next episode, we're gonna jump in and talk about Noah on the fly. We had a I was really interested. I'm glad you asked Michael today about uh his views on the flood. Um, because that's that's gonna be really fascinating. Um we're going to be joined by a professor of, uh, I think it's geomorphology from um, University of Washington in Seattle, uh, David Montgomery. And uh, he's actually done a TED talk on the flood. And uh, oh, wow. he's, an, he's an expert on uh, big floods. So um, he's done sort of, he's done scientific research, which has actually taken him back to myths, what were myths. I mean, myths have mm. kernels of truth in them. And uh, he was researching floods in uh, in Asia and uh, finding out how they uh, how they occurred, you know, massive landslides and whatever, and and then they got uh, they you get these dams formed behind the landslide, and then the you get the overflow, and then it rushes out and you get these massive floods. But yeah, the, some of these things that he'll talk about um, have entered into the the local mythology. Um, so he's very sympathetic to to people um, to flood myths. You know the occur the occurrence of a flood myth in the Bible. Um, yeah, that was a very common thing for these massive catastrophes to occur, and then to for people to sort of find a way to explain how they how you know what was the reason for them, why did they occur, and uh, yeah. people had to make sense of the world they're in. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll also talk about a couple of other things. Uh, um, sci other scientific riddles that uh, sort of are difficult to explain with a, a global flood, but um, but yeah, when you look at all the human ancestry that we've talked about here, and the fossils, and the story of a colonization of Australia, and whatever, um, and if there'd been a massive flood in there, um, it would absolutely nothing would make sense. Um, it, would, it would just be so apparent. And Simon, I just have to thank you. Like getting Robert Rittner and getting Michael Coe, I kind of think of that as, you know, two of the most important moments in Mormon stories history. And we've got what, 1600 episodes and, you mm. know, a couple thousand hours. But I, I didn't know that we would ever be bringing scientists, you know, non LDS scientists on to speak definitively about other matters of, con you know, consensus i don't want to say consensual what's the word of, consensus of consensus science but you're yeah. doing it so so simon you're bringing more scientists to our community and i just want to not only thank you because it's so powerful i want to remind our viewers and listeners that there's a way they can if they value this content there's a way that they can support it they can go to mormonstories.org simon and they can click on the donate button and uh, become a monthly donor and uh, and support this series. We're paying Simon $1,000 a month to do these episodes. We're proud to do that. You will get a, uh, a free book called The Sacred Curse, which science has written as a way to update, um, you know, our understanding of the DNA of Lamanite myth. And mm -hmm. it's it's actually really important. So... You'll get a free copy of that when you sign up um, to support this uh, science versus Mormon doctrine series. But uh, as I've looked at the, you know, we're committed to the series. So Simon, I don't want you to get nervous, but for those listening, the total amount of money that's been donated so far is less than a thousand bucks. So we've, we've kind of already paid you for your first episode and now we'll, we'll pay you for your second, but we, we really, for, for this series to continue, and we want to cover things like the flood, like, 
you know, Lamanite DNA. There, there's so many evolution. There are so many important topics that we want to cover. But we also want to be able to have this be sustainable and pay Gerardo um, and pay Simon uh, and just keep the lights on. So please become a monthly contributor to this series and we'll be able to go at least 10, 15 episodes. And maybe, Simon, we can get a book book out of this when we're all done. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's that's a pipe dream. Well, that, no, that's a possibility. <laughs> yeah. All right, so is, Gerardo, anything else you want to add? No, this one, this one's great. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, wasn't yeah. this amazing? Yeah. Super yeah. excited yeah. for the next one. All right. And all then right. I'll, uh, I will go ahead and right now paste into the uh, chat comments, both on YouTube and on Facebook, a link to where they can donate to support Simon. Simon, you're the best. You're a treasure. Any, <clears throat> anything you want to say before we wrap up? No, I think I'm all out of words. All right. Well, uh, that was great. That was I was just absolutely thrilled with Michael. He's just a great. Um, he's really a great communicator. He can meet, just was brilliant, and it's just lovely to hear him talk today. Yeah. Well, so are you, Simon. Yeah. So are you, Simon. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Simon. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Gerardo. Yeah. And uh, thanks, listeners and viewers. Uh, thanks for your support. Uh, go to mormonstories.org if you want to uh, support the podcast also generally. And then finally, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. And we'll make sure if you have any feedback for Simon, you can either uh, include it in the Facebook comments or in the YouTube comments. But the best way to get any feedback, ideas, recommendations to Simon, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. We'll forward that to Simon and make sure he gets your feedback. All right. All right. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Gerardo. We'll see you guys all soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.